The first item of business is a debate on motion 5879 in the name of Angela Constance on the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. This is stage one. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the requested speak buttons and I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion. Up to 14 minutes please, Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, I'm delighted to open this debate on the principles of the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. In my opinion, the principles are indisputable. This bill will establish Scotland as the only part of the UK with ambitious targets to reduce and ultimately eradicate child poverty. The background to this is that in July 2015, the UK government announced their intention to repeal significant proportions of the Child Poverty Act 2010. They proposed to replace the four income-based targets with measures on worklessness and educational attainment uh, to remove child poverty from the remit of the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission's remit and to rename the legislation the Life Chances Act. As a government presiding officer, we fundamentally disagreed with this approach, in particular the removal of targets and the use of alternative measures that do not take income into account. In the Scottish Government's view, this represents a shift towards characterising poverty as a lifestyle choice eh, rather than addressing the social and economic drivers that cause people to fall into or remain in poverty. The Scottish Government therefore requested an opt-out from the UK Government's plans and committed to bring forward our own approach. And since then, we have worked quickly to consult on and produce the bill that members are considering today. The income and poverty statistics for 2015-16, which were published in March of this year, indicate rising levels of child poverty in Scotland, with 26% of children living in relative poverty after housing costs. And I know that members across the chamber will agree that these numbers are absolutely unacceptable. At a UK level, the Institute for Fiscal Studies has projected that child poverty will increase further in the next few years, in part because of welfare changes imposed by the UK government. And by the end of this decade, the start of the next decade, we will see an increase of child poverty by 1.2 million to over 5 million children. With this bill, presiding officer, the Scottish Government is making a clear statement that child poverty is neither acceptable eh, nor is it inevitable. And that is why our targets, which are set on an after housing costs basis, will be even more stretching than those in, than in the original 2010 Act. What's more, we are acknowledging that income or a lack of income is central to poverty, which is a view that our stakeholders uh, strongly agree with. So if passed by Parliament, the bill will establish uh, Scotland as the only part of the UK to have statutory income targets uh, on child poverty. Our consultation on the bill, which ran from August last year, was designed in collaboration with the Ministerial Advisory Group on Child Poverty and also the First Minister's independent advisor, as well as other relevant stakeholders. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of those who contributed uh, to the development of the bill and all of those who took the time to respond to the consultation. We received a total of 116 responses and a, a broad level of support for the proposals that it set out. So today, President Officer, I very much hope to reassure members that this bill provides the robust framework, the strongest of foundations that are needed uh, to drive our ambition to eradicate child poverty. And the bill is made up of three key elements, which I will now turn to. First, it places a duty on the Scottish ministers to meet four ambitious income targets by 2030, those targets provide a clear picture of the fairer Scotland that we all want to see. Secondly, the bill places a duty eh, on the Scottish ministers to produce regular delivery plans 
the first of which is to be published uh, by April 2018. And each delivery plan will set out the measures that again the Scottish Ministers will take to meet the targets and Ministers will also be required to publish uh, annual progress reports. Thirdly, the Bill places a duty uh, on local authorities and health boards to produce annual local child poverty reports that will outline the measures that they have taken to reduce uh, child poverty at a local level. I would, President Officer, like to take this point to thank the Social Security Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the proposals and their comprehensive Stage 1 report. I will take full account of their suggestions as we take the Bill into Stage 2. And I'm sure that we will have the chance today to debate some of those recommendations uh, in great detail this afternoon. But I would just like to highlight a few key points. Firstly, interim targets. Having listened carefully to the evidence of stakeholders, uh, my view is that interim targets would be more, uh, would be a helpful addition to the legislation. And to be most useful, interim targets need to be set uh, at levels which challenge government to take strong action. But they need also to take account of the evidence, for example, about projected increasing levels of child poverty in the UK and consider what this means for Scotland. Uh, yes. Adam Tompkins. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way on the point of interim targets. I very much welcome uh, what she's just said in terms of uh, wanting to see the bill amended at stage two. Uh, to introduce interim targets. Well, does she agree with me that those interim targets need to be set out on the face of the bill rather than in secondary legislation? Angela Constance. I'll come to the specifics uh, imminently in what I propose to do at stage two. Uh, the point that I want to emphasise firstly is that those interim targets need to galvanise action and uh, be stretching enough, be amb ambitious enough but really to, to, to focus minds. And my concern about the specific interim targets being set on the face of the bill is that that would be prior to some eminently sensible and crucial work being completed. I do, as I'll outline, uh, believe and will bring forward measures to ensure parliamentary uh, scrutiny. But given that we know that child poverty in this country in Scotland and across the UK is projected to rise, that we really do need now to do some work in what the UK implications of rising child poverty to 5 million children, the impact that that will have in Scotland and what expected increases that we can expect uh, to see. So there's an important piece of work uh, that needs to be evidence-led and I think it's very important that in all of this work that we uh, are led by the evidence. Uh, yes. Alex Riley. I think, I mean, I think that, that what, what the Cabinet Secretary said is broadly welcome. But I pick up on the point, I think it was the um, Poverty Action Group made, where they point out that if you have, for example, young couples that are living in poverty and having children, then those children will be brought up in poverty. And the question is, that I would like to ask her is, what is the link between poverty in adults and poverty in children? And does she accept that actually what we need is a coherent anti-poverty strategy for Scotland, as welcome as this, this bill is? I can allow you a little extra time, Cabinet Secretary. Angela Constance. Um, I'm going to answer Mr Rowley's point, but I will come back to the point of parliamentary scrutiny uh, of uh, interim targets because I hadn't completed uh, that point. The point that Mr Rowley makes is uh, very well made. Children are poor uh, because their parents uh, are poor and any child poverty strategy mustn't sit in isolation from that wider uh, anti-poverty strategy. And of course, as a government, we have the Fairer Scotland uh, Action Plan where the number one action was to introduce the socio-economic duty, which will be the overarching uh, duty across the public sector. And, you know, one corner, one platform of that work will indeed be this child poverty bill, but it will also be the last Education Scotland bill that we passed in this parliament, and it will also be the community empowerment uh, plan uh, legislation as well. 
because one of the things we can learn uh, from the past, from the history of child poverty in Scotland and across the UK, is that despite the progress that was made in the early years of the last Labour government, where it stalled uh, was because there wasn't that joined up all government, uh, all country uh, response to tackling uh, child uh, poverty. Now, going back uh, to uh, Mr Tomkins point, my proposal with respect to uh, interim uh, targets is to make reference to the interim targets on the face of the bill and to allow regulations to be made under the bill which specify the levels of the interim targets and to ensure proper scrutiny uh, I will indeed seek parliamentary approval uh, for the interim target levels uh, set out in regulations. Secondly, uh, President Officer, the delivery plans while we received general support uh, for our proposals in the consultation on the bill, the evidence we heard during stage one identified two further areas that merit additional consideration, both of which I'll bring forward amendments on at stage two. On the need for delivery plans to align more closely uh, with the parliamentary terms, I agree with the principle of this. It is crucial that there is a, a clear link between the priorities of a newly formed administration and the duties that ministers uh, will be subject to under this legislation. On the content of delivery plans, uh, my initial view was that we should not restrict ourselves to a short list of issues that delivery plans should consider. However, I accept the arguments in favour of including more detail on this uh, in the face of the bill and will give very careful consideration to which areas it might be appropriate, noting the committee's reference to those suggested uh, by the End uh, Child Poverty uh, Coalition. The evidence tells us indeed that there are some touchstone issues uh, in relation to tackling and eradicating child poverty, uh, and I think we could indeed uh, place those uh, in, in the bill. Presiding officer, uh, I know that achieving the targets set out in the bill will be incredibly challenging. That's probably an understatement. But I would hope that everyone in Parliament today, no matter which side of the chamber they are on, uh, supports our aims to eradicate uh, child poverty. I'm looking forward to a very open and constructive debate this afternoon, and I welcome members' views uh, on the proposals set out in the Bill, uh, and I recommend that Parliament supports its general principles. I now call Sandra White to speak on behalf of the Social Security Committee, around nine minutes, please, Ms White. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, as the convener of the Social Security Committee, I am pleased to be speaking in today's debate on behalf of the Social Security Committee. I would like to th begin by thanking the members of the committee uh, for the constructive way in which we were able to reach a consensus view in our report on the general principles of this bill. I'm also very pleased we were able to be open with each other uh, during committee and in other sessions, uh, recognising the differences of opinion that uh, did exist in some issues, but still reach, reach agreement as set out in a recently published Stage 1 report. And I thank the committee members very much for that. Uh, I also wish to thank all those who took time to respond to the committee's call for evidence, either in writing or in person. And in particular, we were very much enjoyed hearing from our witnesses in Glasgow at the formal evidence session and the informal event we held there in the city chambers uh, to hear from experts in the field and those directly involved was very helpful to our deliberations of the stage one report. I would also like to put on record our appreciation of the Cabinet Secretary coming to the committee with an open mind, being prepared to listen to the evidence we had received and the views expressed by the members of the committee. Uh, willing, her willingness to reflect and come back at stage two with amendments in key areas is something that we very much welcome and look forward to discussing at stage two of the bill. I also want to extend thanks to the committee clerks for all their hard work and uh, thanks to everyone who took part in the evidence sessions and beyond as well. Presiding officer, uh, as all of us here in this chamber agree, there should be no place for child poverty in a modern Scotland. The effects of growing up in poverty can last a lifetime and can impact on health and educational prospects long after a child has grown. We need to make a difference now to the lives of children here in Scotland who are facing poverty. And with that in mind, I want to acknowledge that this legislation was brought forward by the Scottish Government as a direct response to the repeal by the UK Government of significant sections of the UK wild 
Worldwide Child Poverty Act 2010. <clears throat> that repeal included the previous income-based targets for child poverty. Now, research published by the End Child Poverty at the end of last year shows the levels of children in low-income households by local authority across the UK, and these figures tell us that in Scotland, one in four children's lives live in a, a low-income household. And bearing that in mind, one in four, however, in Glasgow, it is actually more than one in three children live in a low-income household. And that really is totally unacceptable. And therefore, as a committee, we felt it was important to meet in Glasgow to find out about the work that is already happening in Glasgow and other areas to tackle child poverty, but also to hear what more needs to be done. What we heard was very powerful, and I will touch on some of the spe specific points made a little later in my contribution. Across the range of the evidence we received, there was strong support for this Parliament to reinstate the income-based targets for child poverty. We were told that putting these targets back on a statutory footing sends a message about the importance we in Scotland attach to addressing child poverty. These targets focus minds and resources and set a direction for where we as a society want to get to. However, we all know that targets will not in themselves reduce child poverty, but they do serve an important part of the bigger picture by enabling us to measure progress in Scotland and to hold the government here to account. Turning to the targets themselves, they mirror the targets previously in the Child Poverty Act 2010. Those targets are already widely recognised and were arrived at following extensive consultations. The targets are all income-based because at the heart of all poverty is a lack of income. Therefore, the amount of available income in a household is what counts when assessing whether a child is living in poverty or not. For the purpose of this bill, income is arrived at after deduction of housing costs. Now, that is an important difference between the targets in this bill and what was in place previously in the UK, and we welcome the approach taken by the Scottish Government. Housing costs are invariably the largest regular outgoing for a household and are an essential cost, and that is why we support the approach taken in this bill. In their evidence to the committee, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, recognise the benefit of taking an after-housing cost approach, but also sounded a caution and a caveat around the element of personal choice that can sometimes exist in relation to housing. We were given the example of two households with the same money coming in, where one household had taken the decision to prioritise the quality of the housing or the house they lived in. In the second household, with exactly the same income, they chose to prioritise the quality of the food or how they lived and purchased. Using those examples, one household could be measured as being in poverty, whilst the other was not. The only difference is that one family prefers or prioritise one thing over another. But despite without sounding that word of caution from the Institute, it is clear that using an after-housing cost basis for calculating income makes the targets in this bill more challenging. We acknowledge this and we do welcome this approach. When discussing household incomes, we also heard the evidence from a number of witnesses about the inequalities of wealth that exist between certain groups in our society. For example, we're told by Engender and others that women are more likely to be living in poverty than men and that lone mothers are more likely to be living in poverty also. Engender told us that tackling child poverty in Scotland is closely linked to gender inequality. Inclusion Scotland told us that disabled children and the children of disabled parents are disproportionately likely to experience poverty. Disabled women are much more likely to be living in poverty than disabled men, and many more disabled women than men are lone parents. And this brings me on to the evidence I would like to highlight about householders who, through no fault of their own, face additional essential costs that greatly reduce their available household income. Costs that do relate to essentials are not a matter of personal choice. Both Inclusion Scotland and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation told us about the extra cost for a household where one or more parents have a disability. They pointed out that the targets in this bill take account of additional income received from disability benefits, but the full impact of the additional costs faced by dis disabled people is not taken into account. 
Inclusion Scotland said, this has the effect of boosting household income and lifting many households containing disabled people out of poverty when the current measure of poverty is applied. Whereas in fact, those same households are consistently shown to be twice the risk of material deprivation compared to households where there are no disabled children or adults. Now, the committee was very struck by this, and for that reason, we have asked the government to consider whether there are other deductions that should be made when calculating net household income, particularly when thinking about people with disability. Now, I want to say some brief words about the date by which the targets are to be achieved. Um, end date, 1st of April 2031. Tackling child poverty meaningfully will take time, and the committee absolutely recognises this. However, a strong measure that came through in our evidence, and the Cabinet Secretary has, has mentioned this, was that interim targets would be helpful. And we are pleased that the Cabinet Secretary said that she was open to revisiting this issue and bring forward proposals at stage two of the bill. And I thank her very much for listening to not just the evidence, but the committee as well. The other important part of this bill, of course, is the mechanism for the government to report its progress to the Parliament. We welcome provisions for delivery plans and annual progress reports. They will enable robust and comprehensive parliamentary scrutiny. We received a lot of evidence around the importance of the delivery plans and a number of suggestions about what delivery plans should cover. Again, our report has made a number of recommendations and we welcome the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to look at them and come back at stage two. Yes. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Could I ask the convener if... Um, the, the recommendation for a statutory commission would cover the calls for independent scrutiny then? Sandra White. This, this was certainly in one of our reports and we did discuss it. I mean, there's basically there's, there's differing of opinion whether it should be statutory or not and exactly what the commission should be. So we'll be looking at this once again at stage two of the committee. But I thank the member for raising that particular, I think, very important point. Thank you. Local authorities and health boards will also report annually on the measures they've taken to address child poverty in the local areas. And again, the committee, which this was raised with us on numerous occasions and by members, again, the committee very much welcome this. We all know of initiatives undertaken locally that could be tied in other areas. And an important role of the local reports would be to share information on what is best. Early in my opening remarks, I said I would come back to some of the evidence we heard in Glasgow. Therefore, I'd like to draw attention to the good work of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and the impact made on child poverty through its Healthier Wealthier Children initiative. I know others are aware of that work also. If I could just mention uh, another couple of initiatives, the presiding officer, I know I went over my time slightly. Uh, we did hear similar stories from the City of Dundee and Fife Council, together with NHS Tayside and Fife, all of whom are building a growing understanding of what works. Great willingness across all of Scotland to increase our focus on tackling child poverty and roll out tried and tested initiative. The Social Security Committee welcomes this bill. It should act as a foundation for ensuring a focus at national and local level on tackling child poverty in Scotland. We need a consistent and sustained effort alongside cultural change in society. For those reasons, the committee supports the general principles of the bill. Thank you, President Officer. I call Adam Tomkins. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Tomkins. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've been looking forward to this debate for, for a while. On these benches, we will be supporting the general principles of the Bill uh, today, but we look forward to trying to make the Bill stronger over the course of stages two and three. I've been thinking about and working on this Bill for a little while, and like Sandra White, I'd like to thank the clerks, uh, to the Social Security Committee, and to all of our witnesses who helped us with our stage one uh, report on the bill, which in my view is the best piece of work that the Social Security Committee has produced uh, so far in this Parliament. I'd also like to thank John Dickey and Peter Kelly uh, for their time and insights and, for, and the Child Poverty Action Group and Child Poverty Bernardos and the Poverty Alliance for discussions and advice about the bill. The Scottish Conservatives share the view, uh, already expressed by Angela Constance and Sandra White, that measuring child poverty is important. But we very strongly believe that, st that taking steps to tackle, uh, to reduce and eventually to eradicate child poverty is much more important. And this bill is introduced, uh, in in includes various provisions to measure child poverty in Scotland. But on its own, and I think Sandra White said this, uh, on its own this bill will not do anything at all actually to lift any child in Scotland out of poverty. And as such, it is, I think, a missed opportunity. 
But this Parliament has the chance, as the Bill progresses through its legislative stages, to improve and to strengthen the Bill so that by the time it reaches the statute book, uh, it can help us not merely understand the scope and incidence of child poverty, but help us as parliamentarians hold the government of the day to effective and robust account for what they are actually doing about child poverty. So let me set out uh, three of the ways in which uh, we will be seeking to improve this bill. First, as we've heard, the bill focuses very narrowly on income. Now, the Cabinet Secretary says that poverty is all about not having enough income, but on these benches, we don't believe that that analysis gets to the root of the problem. And we do believe that unless we do get to the root of the problem, no anti-poverty strategy will succeed, whether that's a child poverty strategy or, as Alec Rowley says, a, a, a more general anti-poverty strategy. For us, it's not enough to say that the solution to poverty is increased income. We need to dig deeper, to investigate, to understand, and without fear or favour, to address and confront the drivers that lead families to have insufficient income in the first place. And while I'm sure that we've all got more to learn about this, we do know quite a lot about what these drivers are. Among them are addiction, family breakdown, unemployment, and educational underattainment. That's not an exhaustive list, but they're all relevant considerations. All of these are drivers of poverty in general and drivers of child poverty in particular. So our core contention, presiding officer, in relation to this bill, well, let me finish the point and then I'll happily give away. Our core contention in relation to this bill is that no anti-poverty strategy will be successful unless these underlying causes of poverty are addressed in a robust and systematic way. Happy to give away. Alex Neil. Thank you very much to the member for giving me. I hear what he says that he thinks that addiction is a driver of poverty, but is it not the case, it's much more likely that poverty is the driver of the addiction. Poverty is the root cause of these problems, not the other way around in most cases. Adam Tromkins. Well, 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 no, I'm afraid I don't accept that. I think that there are behaviours that do drive people into, into poverty. So I, don't, I absolutely don't accept what Alec Neil uh, just said. So what does the bill say about these matters? Addiction, family breakdown, educational underattainment, and the rest. Well, the answer of the presiding officer is that the bill says nothing about them. And I have to say, I find this puzzling. We've all heard the First Minister solemnly proclaim that closing the attainment gap is her government's number one priority. We all know that educational underattainment is one of the key drivers of child poverty. So here in this bill, we have the legislative opportunity for the Scottish ministers to turn the First Minister's stated political aspiration into hard legal reality. Yet it is an opportunity not taken, an opportunity missed. So at stage two, we will be introducing an amendment that seeks to place ministers under a legal duty to take steps to close the attainment gap and to report annually to Parliament uh, on the progress they are making. Angela Constance. Presiding officer, I'm grateful. I am somewhat uh, puzzled and bemused that uh, the member uh, wants to make this legislation, in his words, stronger and more effective, while his government uh, in London actually ripped the heart out of similar legislation that covered uh, the, the length and breadth of the UK. And as I pointed out to, to the member, we already have legislation that places responsibilities on ministers and local authorities uh, to address uh, the attainment gap. And as he well knows that the issues he mentions are properly to be dealt with in the first delivery plan and to be based on evidence and the economic needs of the time. I can allow you extra time for these Thank interventions, Mr officer. Tompkins. On, on the first point, the whole point of devolution is to allow parties to have different priorities in different parts of the United Kingdom without ripping the United Kingdom up. That's the entire point of having a devolved politics. And on the second point, um, Section 1 of the Education Scotland Act places on ministers a duty merely to have regard to the importance of closing the attainment gap, not necessarily to do anything about it. And it's plain from the government's own documentation that that duty does not go far enough. I mean, in the, in the government's own child poverty measurement framework, the percentage of P7 pupils from the most deprived areas performing well in numeracy is going down. The percentage of P7 pupils from the most deprived areas performing well in writing is going down. So it's plain that more needs to be done and more can and should be done on the face of this bill uh, to force uh, ministers' hands. Presiding officer, the Social Security Committee, as we've already heard, was agreed that whether the bill's targets are met will depend on the delivery plans that are to be published in 2018, 21, and 26. And these delivery plans are absolutely critical. There was some discussion in the committee about the frequency and timing 
uh, of, the of the delivery plans, but for my part, I'm more concerned about their content. And on this matter, again, the bill is next to silent. And we were agreed in committee that the bill should set out in detail the matters that must be addressed in these delivery plans. At a minimum, delivery plans must include information about the full use of Scottish social security powers. That is not only the benefits devolved in full, but also the top-up power and the power to create new benefits. They must also include information about employment for parents and carers. And this addresses another of the key drivers of child poverty, children who grow up in workless households. The UK's Life Chances Act requires the Secretary of State to report on the number of children in England living in workless and in long-term workless households. And in our view, presiding officer, delivery plans under this bill should similarly set out the measures taken by and proposed to be taken by Scottish ministers to reduce the number of children in Scotland growing up in families where no parent, guardian or carer is in employment or paid self-employment. The final matter I want to address, presiding officer, is the independence of oversight and scrutiny. And here, the key word is independence. The UK's Social Mobility Commission is a statutory body whose powers and functions are set out in law made by Parliament. Scottish ministers, by contrast, propose to establish an ad hoc, that's Latin, um, an ad hoc non-statutory poverty and inequality commission in respect of which, as I understand it, Parliament will have no oversight as to its terms of reference, powers, remit, functions or personnel. And that isn't a recipe for independent scrutiny, not in any language, and the Cabinet Secretary knows it. So to conclude, Right across the chamber, there is the political will to take the problem of child poverty seriously. I set out how we in the Scottish Conservatives will seek to amend this bill to strengthen it so that it might realise its ambitions. And I look forward to working with MSPs from across the chamber to make that happen. Thank you. Call Pauline McNeill around seven minutes, please, Ms McNeill. Thank you. Labour fully supports the principles of the Child Poverty Bill and I would echo the words of Sandra White and Adam Tompkins giving thanks to the many organisations who give evidence and assist us in our work. We do however think as it stands the bill currently lacks the ambition that is needed but we can work together across the parliament to ensure that it has the level of ambition that such an important issue requires. We are fully behind a targets framework to measure child poverty with a framework that will set out policy and action designed to reduce child poverty by 2030. But I agree that it is policy and action that matters and targets only measure what we do. I believe the committee worked well together to produce a very productive report and I think our consensus, I hope, will strengthen the legislation at stage two and at stage three. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's response today that she accepts that the, the, the introduction of interim targets would be an important contribution, but we are clear it should be on the face of the bill and it should be a statutory right to test those targets somewhere along the way before 2030, and I look forward to the detail on that. The committee rightly adopted the idea from the End Child Poverty Coalition that there should be at least five specified areas in the delivery plan, such as the full use of social security powers and income maximisation, and I agree it should not be restricted to that. But I do think there should be some prescription in the bill, on the face of the bill, so that we can assess uh, that any government would be expected to address policy in those areas. I agree with Adam Tompkins that the, it's the independent scrutiny of the government's work which is essential. And I believe the committee did its job here by making a bold recommendation for the establishment of a commission on a statutory footing to ensure successive Scottish ministers are held to account for their actions. In the past, I have not been a great fan of commissions, I have to say. I've had my arm twisted on more than one or two occasions. Uh, but in this case, I believe that it would make a significant difference in the scrutiny of whichever government is in power. The last Labour government created a tax credit system that transformed lives, reducing levels of child poverty. And according to the IFS research, says that both absolute and relative measures of income poverty felt markedly among children and pensioners. It was driven by very significant additional spending on benefits and tax credits. I quote that because I believe it is the kind of policy ambition that we should support in the lifetime of this parliament. And I do think that fundamentally it is the redistribution of income 
that will make the big difference. And it's why Labour supports the proposals of the Child Poverty Action Group to increase levels of child, ben child benefit by £5 a week, £20 a month, because we believe the impact would be large and transformational. I do agree that there are other factors which entrench poverty in children's lives, but fundamentally it is a lack of income that makes them live in poverty. The Child Poverty Action Group shares some comments with me of those who might benefit from such a policy. It would pay for the breakfast club to help me get to work ahead of time, said one parent. It would cover my daughter's bus ticket to school or pay for an activity once a week, like swimming. So these are the kinds of things that do actually change the quality of life for a child. And some of those experiences, they carry forward with them into adulthood. So they do matter. I will, yes. Ruth McGuire. Thank you. I thank um, Polly McNeill for taking the intervention. Would she accept that topping up child benefit by £5 would also apply to folk on incomes of fifty to £60,000? And that although universalism is a good thing that actually we have to get over the stigmatism of applying for benefits as well. We can't use it as an excuse. Pauline McNeill. Well, sometimes universalism, I think, is necessary in order to help the poorest people. And that's why we support the policy of the Child Poverty Action Group, because that's where we want it to be directed. Children living in poverty are less likely to go to university. They are more likely to have poor health, continue into adulthood. And the cold reality is that living in poverty is likely to affect the length of your ambition, especially if there are not clear ways out of the cycle of poor housing and of low pay. Sadly, child poverty is on the increase and the projections by the FSS, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned earlier, are bleak. They forecast an increase of more than 50% in the proportion of children living in poverty in the UK by 2021, and that's not really that far away. It would reverse most of the fall in child poverty observed in the UK since the late 1990s. In an excellent report that Oxfam provided for this debate, they set out a fundamental point for me, which is that wealth inequality has risen in recent years. It is even more unevenly distributed than income, with the richest 1% own more wealth than the bottom 50% put together. I've listened to the Tories over the last few months uh, say that the best way to get out of poverty is to get into work. And I agree with that to some extent. But the figures, I think, belie that. And I think it's something worth examining. Because 70% of children in poverty are in working families. So it's not enough simply to say that work will solve the problem. In fact, the government's own independent advisor, Naomi Eisenstadt, who's done wonderful work in shifting the curve, says herself that being in work is not enough. We need good pay and enough hours um, in, your, in your work. That is why Labour supports other key measures like a £10 living wage an hour. And that is why we identify that there are 2 billion people, there are 2 billion pounds worth of benefits that people, poor people are missing out on. And that's why there has to be a look at things like automating benefits and looking to see whether it is possible to legislate to ensure that income maximisation both in the Child Poverty Bill and in the forthcoming Social Security Bill might be appropriate. In concluding, presiding officer, I think it's really important that we recognise the role of local authorities in the work they currently do and that the work they, they will do in delivering uh, under this framework, this legislative framework. Um, and I think it's important to look at placing a duty on local authorities and health boards to plan in line with the existing planning process so that there's a streamlining throughout the legislation. Uh, I fully support the principles of the bill. Thank you, presiding officer. We now move to the open debate and it's speeches of around six minutes. I do, however, have quite a bit of time in hand so I can allow extra time for interventions. And I call on Alex Neil to be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also welcome this bill? I think it's high time this Parliament sent out a loud and clear message from right across the chamber that we are determined to do something effective and with reasonable speed in tackling the level of child poverty in our country. 
I also welcome the report. I think it's an excellent report from the Social Security Committee under uh, Sandra White's chairmanship. Although in passing, I would say in recommendation 10, given the Scottish Government's intention to set up a Poverty and Inequality Commission, I don't think we should have a separate Child Poverty Commission because I think Alec Rowley is absolutely right. Tackling child poverty has to be part of a wider, broader, more comprehensive programme for tackling pro poverty across the board. Although I do have a lot of sympathy with the suggestion that the Poverty and Inequality Commission should be placed on a statutory basis. Now, we all know and we quote very often in this chamber the scale of child poverty, presiding officer. But I think we should also remind ourselves of the cost to society of child poverty, because the costs are as high as uh, you could imagine. In a report published in August 2016, not that long ago, Solve UK Poverty stated that the public service costs of poverty across the UK amounted to around £69 billion with identifiable knock-on effects of child poverty costing a further £6 billion and knock-on effects of adult poverty costing at least £2.7 billion. This gives a total cost of poverty in the UK of around £78 billion, a large proportion of what we spend publicly, about one in every five pounds spent on public services is spent to deal with the consequences of poverty in our society. So I say to those who say we cannot afford uh, to deal with child poverty or poverty more generally, I say look at the facts, look at the evidence. We cannot afford not to deal with child poverty and poverty in our society. Now, I fully appreciate the motives of Adam Tompkins. I'm absolutely sure he's motivated on the need, like we all are, to abolish child poverty. But I do fundamentally disagree with his analysis because the evidence does not back up the analysis. And I would draw Adam Tompkins' attention and the Chamber's attention, for example, to an excellent report produced by one of the first-class quangos in Scotland called Health Scotland. And they do a massive amount of first-class research into poverty and, in particular, how to reduce health inequalities in Scotland. And they produced an excellent report about 18 months to two years ago. And it addressed the issue, and this is the fundamental issue we all have to address. What do we need to do to reduce and abolish child poverty and poverty more generally. So they address the issue. What is the most effective way of reducing health inequalities in Scotland? Now, when I heard about their support, I was expecting them to give a litany of action items to be taken by the National Health Service. But actually, their evidence pointed to the conclusion that the single most effective measure that could be taken to reduce health inequalities was making the living wage mandatory for everybody in this country. And had we had the living wage, not the Tory living wage, but the real living wage, that would very quickly actually start to reduce health inequalities. And similarly, in reducing educational attainment, we will not achieve our objectives in reducing educational attainment gaps if we do not, as a prerequisite, tackle the issue of child poverty. If a child is going to school hungry with an empty belly, there is no amount of tuition can overcome the negative impact of an empty belly on that child's education. Now, as a grandfather, as a young grandfather, presiding officer, my wife and I take our grandchildren almost every Sunday to different activities. And they're lucky because their parents, like their grandparents, can afford to do that. But I look at other children, and it might be something like soft play. And for the four of us to go to soft play is about 15 pounds of a Sunday morning. If we're going to the pictures, to see Baby Boss, then that costs over £30. If you're having lunch, 
50 pounds if you're going to McDonald's. That's just one outing of a Sunday morning. But if my grandchildren didn't get that, their ability to have confidence and to explore the world and to read their books and to be able to mingle with other children and adults would be, quite frankly, severely restricted. But how can any parent living on minimum wage or living with zero hours contracts or living on benefit, there is no way on earth these parents or poor grandparents can afford to do that for these children. And therefore, even if they're going to a very, very good school, they still will end up not doing as well as their peers because they don't have that support at home. So I fundamentally disagree with Mr. Tompkins. I see a ta tackling a child poverty and poverty more generally as being initially and as a priority about putting cash in the pockets of the poor. If you don't have the cash, many of the other support services will not work to their full potential. And that is why it's not just important to set targets. That's the easy bit for all of us. That's a dead easy thing to do. Uh, the reality is to put in place a comprehensive anti-poverty strategy at its core tackling child poverty, but poverty more generally. And let me finish with this, presiding officer. When I was doing the job that uh, Ms. Constance is doing, I asked the question of my official. If we were, uh, because if you look at the level of poverty and the definition of poverty, people living in poverty are defined as having 60% or less of the median average household income. So I posed the question, supposing in Scotland, we gave every family that comes into that category enough money to go up to the 60%, how much would that cost every year? And I was expecting a figure of like six billion or eight billion pounds, it's not. Two billion pounds a year. Now, I think we should look at that. That's a gross figure. But the two billion would pay for itself. Because if you take away the cost of the poverty, then the net figure is going to be a lot less than two billion pounds a year. So I think the key thing, and the key signal we have to send out, is yes, we're going to set targets. Yes, we can have an independent commission to monitor it. Yes, we can look at how we publish it and all the rest of it. But the key message that has to go out from this chamber is that we're actually going to do something about it and once and for all really tackle poverty, starting with child poverty in our society. Is there a point of order, Lynn Smith? Officer. I wonder if I could ask through yourself if colleagues could address the microphones because unfortunately I missed some of what was otherwise an excellent speech by Mr Neil. No, thank you, Mr Neil. Uh, thank you very much to Elaine Smith for raising that point, which I was just going to mention that even with uh, Mr Neil's bellowing style, if you excuse my saying, um, that sometimes people can miss it. So to remind everyone that for the benefit of everyone here and, of course, for the official report, it's quite important to be fairly close to the microphone. And I call Liz Smith to be followed by Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'll try very hard to be close to the microphone. I, I suspect that there is no government anywhere that would argue that there is an easy path when it comes to finding wholly effective policies to address poverty. Yet, for exactly the reasons that Alex Neil set out, and I obviously don't agree with uh, his entire assessment, but I think you put it in uh, a very important context. These policies are clearly crucial when it comes to supporting our most disadvantaged communities. For generations, policymakers have struggled to unscramble many of the complexities that surround poverty, including what many argue are the inadequate definitions, which are so often tied to arbitrary income levels. Relative poverty in particular is hard to define and of course there is the ongoing tension which I think Alec Neil was getting at in his speech between the economic policy statistics and the social policy which obviously has a much more subjective foundation and for that alone I think Alec Neil's speech was worth 
listening to, because we all recognise very much what the uh, symptoms are of social exclusion when they occur and the effects that they have and how they are uh, linked to problems such as unemployment, poor housing, crime, uh, educational difficulties and obviously low incomes. But as my colleague Adam Tompkins rightly identified in his introduction, the most important focus for all of us, and I don't actually think there's terribly much disagreement politically on this, must be the causes of poverty rather than just the symptoms because we do not have any major concerns about the general direction of this bill, but we do not believe that it goes nearly far enough in terms of addressing some of the... Yes, of course. Claire Adamson. I appreciate what the, the member is saying um, with regarding this, but I think the problem that some of us on these benches have with what Mr Tompkins says is he conflates the symptoms with the causes, whereas we believe the symptoms are symptoms of poverty and that the, the areas that he mentioned in particular, um, the attainment gap and um, in particular is a symptom of poverty and not a cause. Well, Liz Smith. Thank you. I'll come to the attainment gap in a minute because I think that's a very important part of policy. But if we are going to deal with this properly, we do have to look at the causes, the root causes of poverty, because if we don't do that, personally, I don't actually think we're going to be able to take on board what Alex Neil said at the end of his speech, that we actually have to do something, um, and that's not to forget about uh, the symptoms either. Because it, it uh, yes, all right. Alex Rowley. I, I thank Liz Smith for giving way. The last Labour government introduced tax credits and as a result of that, over a million people, children in, in the UK, was lifted out of poverty, 200,000 of those in Scotland. So the evidence is clear that where government intervenes and ensures that there is more income going into families, then child poverty goes down. And what's her view that 40,000 more children are in poverty in Scotland today than there were last year? Does she accept that that's something to do with government? Liz Smith. Only to some extent, because I think that the, the, the key issue is not just about specific income levels, it is about the root causes that underpin that. You're not just going to get rid of poverty by lifting the income level, you actually have to deal with some of the underlying causes. Now, I, I don't pretend for a minute that this is an easy topic, and I, I don't think anybody in this uh, chamber pretends it is an easy uh, topic, because it isn't. Uh, and there are so many factors, as uh, Claire Adamson reminded us, there are so many interlinks within this. But I, I do not think, and this is where I think there's a deficiency in, in the bill, is that it is not dealing with enough of the genuine uh, underpinning of some of these causes. And that's where I think um, we have to concentrate uh, our energies. Now, I did say I wanted to talk about some of the uh, educational uh, policies that I think are very important in trying to uh, address this. And let me start with... Uh, the situation with uh, the early years because the, the evidence and to come back to uh, what some MSP uh, members are asking for the evidence is important of course it is and one of, one of the critical things about educational evidence is exactly what the early years uh, are, are determined by and it, that's not just starting when they go into nursery school that's even pre-nursery school there's a lot of evidence there that the the nature of the attainment gap which we all want to address uh, that starts early and that's why we believe very fundamentally that you have to focus the delivery of your early year service uh, at these disadvantaged communities, N not by the three and four years, although that's extremely welcome what the Scottish Government has done in that area, but actually focusing on some of the disadvantaged one and two year olds where I think that we have specific issues. Now I've got very little time left, but can I just say that I also believe very fundamentally that the, the when it comes to the uh, literacy and numeracy that we've been talking about a very great deal in this chamber uh, over the last uh, few months, that is crucial, absolutely crucial, in terms of raising the opportunities that young people have to be able to aspire to their education and to take that on and to acquire the skills that they need in later life. And when it comes to the Pupil, to Pupil Equity Fund, which we entirely agree is the right way forward, I really do believe that that is an opportunity for schools, but it has to come from the schools themselves. I hope there will not be too many edicts from local authorities or from national government about how that money is spent, because I really do believe that it will be the head teachers who are the ones in the position to make the right decisions about what will best help there. Deputy President, Officer, can I finish uh, on the point that I think that 
this, this bill, uh, in no way uh, there is there anything uh, that we would uh, disagree with in the basic principles, but I think we can do a lot more to ensure that it has that robust stance that we all want to see, and that's why I think we will be bringing forward a variety of amendments at stages two and three. It was complete, completely off script. I call Richard Leonard to be followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. The number of children uh, growing up in poverty in Scotland is rising, not falling. Relative child poverty up from 22% of Scotland's children to 26% in just 12 months. Absolute child poverty up from 21% of children in Scotland to 24% in 12 months. Over a quarter of a million children in Scotland today living in poverty. And almost 70% of those children are in households in work, which is not, as I keep pointing out to the government, not the sign of a resilient labour market, but of a labour market mired in poverty pay, underemployment and insecure work. And to the Conservative members, these are not lifestyle choices, these are economic impositions which people are facing. We rationally expect, we rationally expect equal treatment before the law, so why should we accept such a huge irrational inequality? Why should we accept a society with a shameful contrast of unbridled private adult wealth on the one hand and public childhood destitution and squalor on the other? Visited on those children, visited not on those who have created these severe and capricious inequalities, but upon those who through a chance of birth are simply born into it. And we know the result. Horizons limited, life expectancy itself cut, cycles of poverty that pass from one generation to the next. And that is what this parliament needs to tackle and this bill provides us with a start. There is an emerging consensus, which I hope the cabinet secretary can join, that the time is past when this parliament can merely set targets. The time is past when this parliament can simply count the growth in child poverty. The time has come to end child poverty. The Cabinet Secretary told the Social Security Committee recently about a new socio-economic duty which she is contemplating. But the other duty here in this Parliament is our moral duty, our moral duty to act. That is why the committee, containing members of the Cabinet Secretary's own party, is demanding statutory interim targets on the face of the bill, not in regulations, but on the face of the bill. That is why the committee is demanding tougher action to root out persistent poverty and a tougher definition of it too. It cannot be right either that in a household where there is an adult or child or both with a disability, material deprivation is so much worse, which is why we are also asking the government to revise its calculation of the net income in such households. Neither can it be right that children from minority ethnic backgrounds are twice as likely to live in poverty than white kids. So we need robust delivery plans with a clear and traceable link to the Scottish Government's budget to tackle this and other inequalities. The committee also recommends, as we've heard, the establishment of a statutory commission to provide independent scrutiny and oversight of progress with powers to investigate and where necessary to call this or a future Scottish Government to account. Not a ministerial advisory group, but an independent commission established by statute through this bill subject to a parliamentary power of appointment. As the Child Poverty Action Group spell out, the commission should have, and I quote them, members with expertise in measuring and understanding poverty. It should have members with expertise in engaging with those people experiencing or at risk of poverty and with an in-depth understanding of the causes and effects of child poverty. We talk in the bill about income after housing costs and it is right that the bill focuses on statutory income targets. That is why Labour advances the case for increasing child benefit by five pounds a week, an already universal benefit, which would lift 30,000 children in Scotland out of poverty at a stroke. But the economic condition people find themselves in 
It's not just pecuniary deprivation. There is a deprivation of power which comes with poverty as well. And this powerlessness leads to hopelessness and so all too often to acquiescence. So it is not just economic growth we need, but a fundamental change in the wider organisation of the economy. Not just a redistribution of wealth, but a redistribution of power. Our demand, the labour demand, is not simply to take the tears out of capitalism, but to bring about a change that is much more radical than that, based upon transformed relations of power, built upon foundations of equality and democracy in our economy, where government spending on housing, on education, on old age pensions and social security is not viewed as a private burden, but as a social investment, where we create a truly civilised society which is productive, but which shares its wealth with a sense of social justice and with a sense of social cohesion and solidarity of human spirit as well. And all of this standing on a rock of faith, that old labour rock of faith of equality and the equal worth of all. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Tavi Scott. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The main purpose of, of the bill we debate today is to set in law a series of targets for the reduction of child poverty. And the challenge of achieving those targets was underscored earlier this year when the latest child poverty statistics revealed that there had been a 4% rise in relative child poverty in just one year. And that, as we know, is a rise of 40,000 children to 260,000. Now, relative child poverty, Liz Smith touched on this, can be an opaque term, but Peter Townsend, Britain's leading expert on poverty, argues that it is when someone lives with resources that are so seriously below those commanded by the average individual or family that they are, in effect, excluded from ordinary living patterns, customs and activities. The little trips out that some may take for granted and that Alex Neil described so well. That means that there are 260,000 children whose families can't afford to feed them the same breakfast their classmates have every morning, and they struggle to concentrate at school as a result. It means that a quarter of a million children aren't able to go on the school trips their peers get great educational benefit from. And for constituency members in the chamber today, that is 3,500 children in your constituency. For regional members like myself, 32,500 children. That is the scale of the challenge we face. And before I move on, I'd like to remind us again why the bill is even needed. The statutory child poverty targets in the bill have existed before, but they were removed by the UK government's Welfare Reform and Work Act last year in favour of measures relating to worklessness and educational attainment. Now, while I agree that worklessness has a link to poverty, as indeed does educational attainment, the focus on worklessness implies that work is always a route out of poverty, and that, as we've already heard in this debate, is simply not the case. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation released figures in December showing that one in every eight workers in the UK, that's 3.8 million people, is now living in poverty. A total of 2.6 million children across the UK are in poverty despite being in a working family. And in Scotland, we've heard this, these figures bear repetition. 70% of children live in households, 70% of children in poverty live in households with at least one working adult. A 15% increase over the years between 2010-11 to 2015-16. Now, child poverty is multifaceted, but the lack of an adequate income, whether that's from work, benefits, or a mixture remains its decisive characteristic and must remain central to any poverty measurement and any strategy to decrease child poverty. And that's why the Greens warmly welcome the reinstating of these targets and why we will be supporting the principles of the bill at decision time later today. I will be bringing an amendment to the bill to ensure that the delivery plans cover five key areas recommended by the End Child Poverty Coalition. And the first of these will relate to the full use of the social security system. We know that using social security benefits to boost the incomes of our poorest families can pull hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty. We know that, um, and I think Richard Leonard and um, Alex Rowley have touched on this, we know it because it's been done before. 
is just that it has been undone in recent years by the so-called welfare reform. I mean, the Institute for Fiscal Studies suggests that the, the projected increase in child poverty can entirely be laid at, explained by the direct impact of reforms to tax and benefits. Um, the Institute for Fiscal Studies also argues that investment in child benefit and child tax credits between the mid-90s and 2010 was the key factor behind historically and internationally unprecedented reductions in child poverty and associated improvements in child wellbeing. But we're now going backwards. By 2020, it's projected that child benefit will have lost 28% of its value when compared to 2010. And we can start to address this by adding an extra five pounds to the benefit, as both the Child Poverty Action Group Scotland and the Scottish Greens have called for previously, and Pauline McNeill has called for this too today. We know that when child benefit is paid, it goes to more intended target recipients than almost any other benefit apart from the state pension, with 95% of those eligible for it making a successful claim. And while I very much welcome the significant improvements to early years grants announced on Tuesday, the Sure Start Maternity Grant only reaches around 50% of eligible families, though I have no doubt that the Scottish Government will work hard to increase that. We know now that child benefit will get to those who need it and make a huge difference to child poverty. And while I accept that the near universality of child benefit means that some of the additional spending would go to relatively well-off families with children not in poverty, there are a range of problems with a more means-tested equivalent. CPAG have commissioned research that shows that such a move would cut child poverty by 14%, lifting 30,000 children out of poverty, and that would very quickly go a long way to achieving the targets the Scottish Government is setting. No wonder the idea has support not only from the Child Poverty Action Group, but also the Poverty Alliance, One Parent Family Scotland, the Church of Scotland, and both the outgoing and new Children and Young People's Commissioners. Food banks report that child benefit is very often the only source of income that families presenting to them have when their means-tested benefits and the system delivering them have failed. Now, the Scottish Government talks of social security as an investment, and I agree with that approach wholeheartedly. And indeed, at around £250 million annually, a £5 top-up would be a significant investment. But as we've heard from others, and the University of Loughborough conservatively estimate that child Poverty costs us £750 million a year, so this is an investment we can't afford to make. Presiding officer, the targets in the bill represent a major challenge, one we must rise to. We should be ashamed that in such a wealthy country, so many of our children live below the average accepted standard, and the likelihood is that if they live in poverty, they'll stay there, and their own children will experience poverty too. This is a cycle we need to break. The bill needs to be clearer about how the targets are going to be achieved and to provide more policy tools to achieve them and break that cycle. But nonetheless, what we have today is potentially the beginning of the end of child poverty in Scotland, and I commend the Scottish Government for that ambition. Thank you. I call Tavish Scott to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. I also think Alec Neil needs a stage, not a microphone, when he's on his feet and in that, uh, in, in that kind of form. Uh, but uh, can I say at the outset uh, both that the Liberal Democrats very much support the legislation in front of us uh, today, and secondly say that my social liberalism is rather closer to Alec Neil and Richard Leonard's than to the economic views of those uh, on the other benches uh, today. And I don't say that in any kind of politically aggressive way. I just think the reality of the arguments uh, are stronger on that side of the economy. And they are for two reasons, and the two influences on me in this, in this area of vitally important public policy are one Sir Harry Burns, the former Chief Medical Officer, who gave evidence to, I forget now which parliamentary committee I was on in, in either the last session or the session before, and he laid out in stark, uh, simple but incredibly elegant terms the, the crucial links between no job or, as Richard Leonard rightly said, poverty wages uh, and a lack of educational uh, attainment or rather educational failure poor housing, health inequalities, pressure, stress, mental health issues, not just about for people of an older age, but in this case of young people. Uh, and therefore the need to address that in the round and to address the underlying uh, reality of what that um, means for too, too many. And as the Cabinet Secretary and many others around the Chamber this afternoon have set it out, the ball statistics are, as Alison Johnson has effectively just said, 
scary, frightening, use whatever rhetorical word you want, particularly seven days before an election. But it, whatever it is, it cannot be good enough that there are so many, so many young Scots who are in that uh, definition, if definition is the right word, uh, of uh, a set of circumstances that none of us, whatever side of the political equation we're on, can in any way find acceptable uh, today. The second influence was, and Polly McNeill rightly mentioned her, was Naomi Essenstadt, who is not, a, not an academic I'd take on on any basis uh, whatsoever. She gave a tub-thumping speech at the SCDI forum back in um, a month or so ago. Uh, she wasn't particularly kind, I, I'll cabinet secretary have to forgive me for this, she wasn't particularly kind about things that, like the council tax freeze, but that can be no surprise uh, to anyone on the SNP benches. But she also said some fundamental things about universalism and the challenge of what that actually means, as opposed to the choices that we can make in politics and where we should direct uh, our, uh, our resources, our efforts and our our approach. Uh, so those uh, people, people of, of not just um, Scottish importance, but I would argue of international importance in their analysis of why poverty has to be addressed and how to address it and the reasons and underlying uh, fundamental feelings of public policy at this time uh, are to be listened to. Uh, and this bill, I hope, is part of a series of measures that need to be taken in order to address exactly uh, that. It's right that we seek to uh, take forward legislation in this place uh, to eradicate poverty. It's both philosophically right and it's right, of course, in practice. It cannot be at all acceptable that more than a, a quarter of young Scots live in relative poverty today. And as, the, as various um, members have said today, an IFS, an Institute of Fiscal Studies forecast that says that by 2020, child poverty across the UK will rise by 50% has to be utterly unacceptable to any government of any political persuasion and there cannot be a, a, a response to that which says more of the same. So those are the challenges. There three, seem to be three points that should be uh, addressed uh, in terms of the specific measures that the government are proposing in this bill. And I'm not sure I necessarily have got this worked out yet. The first is on uh, targets. Now, as Alec Neil said, we can all pass uh, targets, and all governments do it, believe me. All governments uh, run them out. It's the, it's the easiest thing going. And uh, if you don't meet them, what then happens? Now, I suppose some of the response to that is what's happened on CO2 emissions, where government has missed its targets, but without a shadow of a doubt, because of a, a range of parliamentary pressures, including, I'm sure, from uh, their own side, that has started to move in the right direction. Um, I wasn't sure about Adam Tompkins' analysis that more needed to be on the face uh, of the bill, because if, and I may have picked him up wrong, and he's very, I'm very happy to give away on this, um, if, if educational attainment targets are to be put onto the bill, and that's, I think, what he was hinting at in his, or maybe just said in his, his speech, why stop there? Why stop just with educational attainment uh, targets in a, on this kind of bill. You could, for example, have sports participation uh, levels. You could have, certainly have fuel poverty targets because uh, we certainly in my part of the world, we absolutely know that fuel poverty uh, comes down to a choice for too many families of heat versus food. Uh, you could also have house build completion targets based on building insulation uh, challenges and building insulation um, standards. So it just seems to me that uh, if you're going to amend this bill uh, to widen out the targets, you need to be very conscious of where that argument goes in terms terms of the, of the organisations in this usual case local government that you are laying that target on. It's not actually about this government or for that matter any government in here but it is on the uh, it is actually on the agency or body that will ultimately have to take forward uh, that, uh, that target. And then we haul ourselves frankly into a world of constant ministerial direction again it, irrespective of who the government is, constant ministerial direction because Parliament's passed a target that means that if, if X local authority area, say Glasgow, does not achieve that standard, then what is the minister going to do about it? So I think, I think in making those kind of proposals for stage two and three of this bill, um, uh, members of parliament need to be careful about analysing what they're setting themselves uh, up for. The second area I wanted to touch on is, this in, is the proposal around independent commissions. And in the briefings today, and all of them were, uh, I thought, thoughtful and uh, highly uh, articulate, uh, there seemed to be uh, a commonality of view that an independent commission was the right uh, way forward. Now, like Polly McNeill, I have my doubts about yet another independent uh, commission, and I, and I hope the government will really think about that very carefully indeed. Alec Neill made a sensible proposal that the Poverty and Inequality Commission... You see, when I mentioned Alec Neill's uh, name there, did you hear the cry? 
why. I mean, uh, it, it, he does bring tears to our eyes on so many occasions. But uh, uh, the Poverty and Inequality Commission um, is indeed, sorry, I apologise, is, is, is indeed, I, I think, a, a, worthy, um, a worthy route forward in this area. And the last point was, uh, was just on the independence of local government. Now, government, the, uh, the Scottish government, have every right to lay a duty on health boards. After all, health boards, I hardly need to say this to ex-ministers uh, of health, but health boards are in the beck and call of ministers. They do what they are told. It is literally the jump and how high type of scenario. But local government is, and it should be remembered, different from that. They have their own mandate. They have their own responsibilities. And they are also being told day in, day out at the moment, that the number one priority of our government is educational attainment, is closing the attainment gap, is education. We need to be careful in, po in public policy terms of now saying that the number one opportunity, uh, the one number one target is child poverty. And I just would like the government to slightly uh, reflect on the uh, challenges of the, of the approach they want to take. Uh, education fits into child poverty. Uh, what is the uh, absolute uh, cri criteria in that area? Uh, so today is a long overdue call to arms, presiding officer. The challenge is, as Alec Neil very rightly said, getting things now uh, done. But I just come counter with one uh, final observation. Uh, we went through some of this with, and you'll remember, Deputy Presiding Officer, with uh, medical inequalities some years back and the Arbuthnot formula and all the challenges around that. And sensible proposals were made, Mike Rumbles will remember this, about taking money from one health board area and moving it to another. Politics got in the way. Good luck. Uh, thank you. I've been a bit generous because we do have a little time in hand. Um, Ruth McGuire followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The introduction of this child poverty bill, which contains both ambitious statutory income targets and stringent reporting requirements at both national and local level, is a hugely important move and one that I, along with many others, welcome wholeheartedly. Achieving the four main targets in the bill would, to quote the Child Poverty Action Group, make a huge difference to the health, well-being and future prospects of tens of thousands of children across Scotland. Because only by increasing the incomes of families at risk of poverty can lasting progress be made towards improving child well-being. For this reason, it's correct that these targets are based on net household income. Quite simply, although there are many dimensions to poverty, income or lack of it is unequivocally at the heart of them all. This fact is widely recognised by stakeholders who have warmly welcomed the income-based focus of the bill. Presiding officer, I share Peter Allen of Dundee City Council's disdain of the claim, which is often made by people in positions of privilege, that poverty of aspiration is worse than poverty of income. No, it's not. Rather, as he said to the Social Security Committee, the poverty of having no food and sending your bairns to bed cold with no food. Uh, sorry, sending, having no money and sending your bairns to bed cold with no food. That is poverty. Whatever else the approach is about, it has to be about the money. But we know the issue is not just about money. The Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland has also stated its strong support for the four income-based targets, noting that these measures are internationally recognised as robust measures of child poverty and are the product of more than four decades of consultation and development by successive governments at UK and Scotland level. It's also correct that the bill is target-focused, because although we're well aware that targets and measuring on their own do not solve a problem, they do create an unambiguous, overarching national aspiration, focusing diverse minds, approaches and organisations on one clear, shared goal. At this point, I'd like to quote Dr Margaret Hanna of NHS Fife, who, giving evidence to the Social Security Committee, said, For me, the target of addressing child poverty is an indicative target to mobilise us as a country towards something more ambitious on what is an intractable or difficult challenge. Similarly, Shelter Scotland recognised that the statutory income targets of the bill serve to focus the priorities and resources of policymakers at a national and local level. The four main income targets provide both a clear goal and a robust framework within which all manner of more detailed and nuanced approaches towards tackling child poverty can be discussed and included. These will be set out and scrutinised through the regular delivery plans, the first of which will be published by the Scottish Government before April 2018, with annual reports on progress also a requirement. Local authorities and health boards will also be required to produce annual local child poverty action reports, outlining the work and action that they've done to reduce child poverty locally. 
In all of this, the Bill will galvanise action and focus minds across all Scottish Government portfolios and all local authorities and health boards. It will allow us to build on the wide range of work already being done to ch tackle child poverty across Scotland, from the Attainment Fund, the Council Tax Reduction Scheme and the Scottish Baby Box, to name a few things. And it will provide an opportunity for Parliament to scrutinise and monitor the progress being made. As a member of the Social Security Committee, I've heard extensive evidence in favour of interim targets and agree that they would be helpful. I'm pleased that the committee's recent Stage 1 report included the recommendation that interim targets should be on the face of the bill. However, any interim targets must be realistic and achievable. And crucially, they must drive momentum towards our goal of eradicating child poverty and not stall it. Lastly, presiding officer, it's worth reflecting again on why we were even here debating a Child Poverty Scotland bill in the first place. We're here because the UK Tories took the disgraceful decision to repeal the UK-wide income-based targets for child poverty and to remove the child poverty remit from the then Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission. As is so often the case when we discuss social security in this chamber, the contrast between the values and actions of this SNP government and the Tory government at Westminster couldn't be starker. As the Tories abandoned their child poverty targets and pushed countless more children and families into poverty, this SNP Scottish Government is introducing its own ambitious targets and signalling its unwavering commitment to eradicating child poverty. I'm not surprised that the Tories were anxious to bury the figures when it comes to their plans for lifting people out of poverty. In 2010, the Tory Lib Dem coalition estimated that as many as 350,000 and 500,000 working adults could be moved out of poverty by changes to welfare, such as the introduction of universal credit. Far from reducing it by hundreds of thousands, the scandalous reality is that the Tories' programme of welfare reform, which includes now the callous two-child cap, are dramatically increasing child poverty, with one million more children expected to be living in poverty by 2020. I shudder to think of the further cost to society at the hands of an unfettered right-wing Tory government. Here at home, there's always going to be limitations to what the Scottish Government can achieve, with one hand effectively tied behind its back, shackled to a UK Tory government whose hostile welfare policies are having a devastating impact on our communities. Too often it can feel like we might be running just to stand still. Much of our recent debate about social security in this chamber has been about mitigation and opposition, from the bedroom tax to the two-child cap and rape clause. This is important, if regrettable. I have to say my ambitions for Scotland go far beyond just mitigation and opposition, presiding officer. I don't underestimate the challenge that stands before us, and it's a task made all the more difficult with a Tory government at Westminster pursuing, frankly, a cruel assault on low-income households, families and pensioners. Child poverty, family income squeezed, pensions cut. This is the true cost of a Tory government. And as we debate the Child Poverty Act today, it strikes me now more than ever that there's a clear choice to be made next week between Tory MPs who'll simply rubber stamp more devastating cuts to Social Security and SNP MPs who'll oppose austerity and call for a fairer society for all. I think we all know which will be more helpful as we pursue the aim of this bill. Thank you. I call Gordon Lindhurst, to be followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Lindhurst, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, as a member of the Social Security Committee, I've had the opportunity of engaging with the finer details of the Child Poverty Bill and also to listen to the evidence presented to us by a number of organisations that do such important work in this area. Um, we had organisations give evidence to us ranging from Inclusion Scotland, the Law Society of Scotland, to End Child Poverty, amongst others. Uh, they have had their say on this bill, and it is encouraging to note their broad support for it, and I thank them all for their input. As my colleague Liz Smith has already said in her very careful and reasoned speech, tackling child poverty is not an easy task for any government. Poverty in itself is a complicated issue and can arise for a number of different reasons. It is something which can afflict any of us at any point in our lives. It is perhaps the complex nature of the issue that gives rise to varying views as to how it should be solved. And the bill we have before us, contrasted with some of the suggestions we've heard today, 
um, indicate how difficult it is to arrive at a, an agreed position on how to improve the situation. What is clear is that with 21% of children living in a household in absolute poverty, 16 percentage points from the 5% target set for 2030 through this legislation, progress must be made. In order to really tackle the problem of child poverty, we cannot simply identify the numbers and then throw money at the problem without thinking about what lies at the heart of it. We must have credible and detailed plans for how we tackle it at its root. This includes, this includes a holistic approach that sees the government facilitating the tools to give people that need it the helping hand up so that they can help themselves. And I will give way to the member at that point. Ashton. I, I thank the member very much for taking an intervention on this point. A number of Conservative speakers this afternoon have um, used this phrase, root causes, to discover what are the root causes of, of child poverty, as if it's in some way mysterious. So I'll just um, explain to you what the Institute of Fiscal Studies have said in a recent report. This is an predicted, intervention, so is, not a speech a short, please. Yes. That an additional 1.2 million children will be pushed into relative poverty by 2021. And the reason for that, they are saying, is UK tax and benefit changes. So the root cause we're seeing here is actually a Tory government. Would the member reflect on that? Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, no, not at this stage, because I thought you were asking a question rather than giving a speech. So to return, return to my own speech, solving problems such as the attainment gap and worklessness are examples of these. We need to make sure that our young people from all backgrounds are equipped with the skills that will be vital for them throughout their life. Skills that will send them out justly confident into the world of work. Um, why not? Well, I don't think that was terribly gallant, but Miss White. I don't, I don't mind. I can be gallant as well. I, I just want to say to, to, the, to the member you mentioned about the attainment gap, which seems to be what obviously the, the Tories are pushing for, would you not agree, not just with me, but experts as well, if a child is not getting the right food, is not getting heat, then obviously for them to even go to school at all is a challenge. <laughs> and if people are not getting the right food, their brains don't... You know, they, they won't develop the same. Surely you must recognise that. To reach attainment, you've got to have the right food and at least heat in your house. Mr Linters. Uh, Mr Presiding Officer, I meant no disrespect to the convener of the Social Security Committee by my response to her desire to make an intervention. And I wouldn't wish my response to have been understood in that way. Uh, and of course, I do agree with her because as I have said, these issues are, relate to a complex interplay of many factors. So I don't disagree with what the convener has said at all, and I would thank her for that intervention. Um, and I would say, continuing on from where I left off, that it is unacceptable that the percentage of primary seven pupils from the most deprived areas performing well in numeracy dropped by more than seven points between 2014 and 2016. Figures such as these do nothing to end the cycle of poverty in some of our most deprived communities. And I am confident that closing and eventually ending the attainment gap could play a big part in meeting the targets as set out, alongside other measures which others have referred to which clearly do relate to the underlying causes of poverty. But the government also needs to regularly step back and assess the broad picture of what effects its measures are having in tackling child poverty. The risk in not doing so is that we reach 2030 and find that child poverty is unchanged or worse. At this stage, I wish to make some progress, so not at this point, thank you. Now, the risk if we do not succeed on this is that we reach 2030 and find that child poverty is unchanged or worse, and that would be a waste of 13 years. I raised the issue of interim targets in the committee, as did others, and I'm pleased the committee report has included the recommendation that interim targets should be, on the face of the bill, on a statutory footing. Now, that, of course, is different than if these were simply included in a statutory in instrument, because it helps aid our focus on them and gives them a greater immediacy. It provides the certainty that statutory instruments would not. 
they can be so easily hollowed out to defeat the purpose of primary legislation and render it ineffective. Now, I acknowledge the Cabinet Secretary's comments in interim targets and agree they must be considered carefully and not simply plucked from a particular point on a scale that works towards the end goal in 2030. Targets are important, they must be bold, but they must, as has already been said, also be credible. It is important that successive governments between now and 2030 are accountable for the actions they are taking to bring down child poverty. And it is an issue that pervades political cycles and cannot simply be dropped beyond the next election, whatever party happens to be in power. So I, I hope, therefore, the government takes on board the views of the committee when it comes to uh, a statutory commission independent of government, one that has parliamentary oversight and is fully independent from government so that it can have the confidence of this parliament to hold the government to account. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I will conclude by saying the Scottish Conservatives are today pleased to support the principles of the bill before us in the hope the measures to tackle child poverty are strengthened. Parties within the chamber are agreed on this, on the end goal, and I look forward to continuing to work with colleagues in the process of how we actually get there. We must be tough on child poverty and the causes of child poverty. Thank you very much. I call Ben McPherson, be followed by Elaine Smith. Mr McPherson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Social Security Committee, I would also like to thank all of the witnesses who gave evidence to our committee, fellow committee members for their collaborative spirit, and the committee clerks for all of their work and assistance. Presiding Officer, we live in a rich country. Scotland and Britain are rich countries. However, despite this, and totally unjustly and inexcusably, today hundreds of thousands of children on these islands will suffer the consequences of unnecessary man-made poverty. As David Heyman so powerfully put it recently, they will go to sleep at night in unheated rooms with little or nothing in their bellies. They will never get a birthday present. They will never get a Christmas present. No one will ever buy them an ice cream. No one will ever take them to see Star Wars. Their opportunities to give their best and make the most of their abilities will be needlessly curtailed and damaged. Every day will be a struggle to get by for them and for their families. In Britain right now, four million children live in poverty. And IFS have stated that under UK government welfare reform and austerity, this figure will rise to five million. Shockingly, around the same number of people as the population of Scotland. Presiding officer, it doesn't have to be this way. And so today, by progressing this child poverty bill through this parliament, we can start another chapter in the process of trying to change the unacceptable reality that here in Scotland, more than one in four children, approximately 260,000 children, are officially recognized as living in poverty, a figure that has increased by around 40,000 since 2014-15, principally as a result of UK government policy. And so I very much welcome the bill as a means to focus minds and policy makers by way of the income-based targets the bill proposes and to introduce a set of robust reporting mechanisms. If passed by the will of Parliament, the bill will re-establish income targets on child poverty in Scotland after the UK government regrettably repealed large parts of the Child Poverty Act 2010. The enhanced targets in the proposed legislation are both suitably ambitious and realistic, and I support them as set out in the bill at section one. And while the bill alone will not eradicate the problem of child poverty, what it will meaningfully do is pave the way for more action to be taken to, in the words of End Poverty Action Group, ensure that the scandal of child poverty remains high on the public and political agenda. In order to keep the issue on the public and political agenda, the committee heard strong and persuasive evidence from many witnesses that interim targets would aid focus and create greater immediacy. And so I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment in her response to the committee's report to bring forward an amendment at stage two to place the principle of interim targets on a statutory footing. And in order to meet both interim and final income-based targets, 
I strongly support the Scottish Government's determination and intention for the Bill to coordinate action to tackle poverty by the way of proposed delivery plans. These will be pivotal in order to focus Scottish Government and multi-agency action to achieve the targets and make the necessary difference to assist the children so unfairly affected. The delivery plans will also be crucial in order to adapt and deal with any further UK Government cuts or other unhelpful decisions the UK Government might make on reserved issues. Given their importance, as a committee, we recommended that the Scottish Government consider evidence received about issues, concepts and strategies to be included in the delivery plans. And therefore, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to bring forward an amendment at stage two, setting out appropriate areas to be taken account of in the delivery plans and make specific reference to the measurement framework and take budget considerations into account. Presiding officer, when I made my first speech in this chamber around a year ago, I spoke of our unifying hope of a better Scotland. And despite some party political differences that are apparent, I believe that there is a unifying hope in the chamber today to get this right and for the legislation and resulting action to make the difference that's undoubtedly required. But what will also be equally, and if not more important, is the continued need for as long as Scotland remains part of the UK, for all of us to oppose destructive and unhelpful Westminster government policy, which has most often been the cause of increases in child poverty in our time. And so in good faith, I ask all fellow MSPs of all parties to press whoever is the next UK government to reverse austerity and welfare reform policies that are having a devastating effect on communities and increasing child poverty on these islands. And also to press any UK government to tackle low pay and insecure work because the root causes, and this has been mentioned in the debate today, the root causes of poverty are low pay, insecure work, welfare cuts and fiscal austerity, all of which primarily lie at the Westminster Parliament. It's been spoken about how not only is austerity and the cost of child poverty an ethical issue, but it also doesn't make any economic sense. The costs uh, which have been identified by the Child Poverty Action Group are those of 29 billion a year, including policy interventions, long-term losses to the economy, lower educational attainment, and poorer mental and physical health. And so it is in all of our interest to tackle child poverty in Scotland and beyond for ethical and, uh, ethical and economic reasons. Presiding officer, Shelter Scotland have stated that the interconnected issues of poverty, homelessness, high housing costs and welfare changes must be addressed together if we are meaningfully to tackle them. And so I support the general principles of this bill because it is an important and helpful step in that wider process of positive social economic change. If passed, this bill will send a message of intent and provide the foundations for ensuring a sustained focus at a Scottish Government level and at a local level. Child poverty is not an inevitability of a market-based economy. It is a result of ideological, neoliberal economic policies that have been created by politicians on the right and encouraged by those with power and interest in preserving the status quo. And so to conclude, I believe that this bill can be part of a process of change and help create a renewed shift in social consciousness towards creating a fairer society and a more compassionate society. The bill will help refocus all of our efforts and remind us that we can tackle the man-made problem of child poverty in our communities and in our time with urgency and collective determination. Thank you very much, Ms McPherson. I call Elaine Smith to be followed by George Adam. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. Last Sunday at a Jeremy Corbyn event in Glasgow, Ian Lavery, Labour's candidate for Wandsbeck, told us that on a school visit in his constituency, he saw a young boy in detention. And when he inquired as to why, he found out that his crime was taking a sandwich from a classmate's bag because he was so hungry. You know, it really is unbelievable that we have to debate child poverty in the 21st century. However, the statistics in this report, the committee report, shows that we do. 
The report tells us, and we've heard it from other members today, that over a quarter of children in Scotland in 2015-16 were living in relative poverty after housing costs, and that has increased from the previous year. And more than one in three children in Glasgow are currently living in poverty. President Officer, I'd like to commend the, the committee on the report, which is certainly a very worthy piece of work, but it lacks the real life stories that lie behind the statistics and the passion that drives the determination to end child poverty. However, of course, that may be because the bill under scrutiny is simply one that sets out targets and provides a framework for reporting. And as such, it doesn't specify the policy actions or level of resources which will be needed to reduce levels of child poverty. And I do note um, the Cabinet Secretary's remarks earlier in the debate on this issue and also the committee convener's speech, which did um, give some more depth to the report. So since it seems uh, that we're all agreed in the general principles of the bill that it should be supported, I think it's important today to consider exactly why we need targets and reporting, and also why uh, Labour believes that we need a statutory duty to reduce child poverty. President Officer, the Holyrood Baby Initiative is interesting, but I'm sure we all personally know a Kirsty, one of the children in poverty in a working family. The Kirsty that I know is a smart wee eight-year-old. She's a talented singer. She's got fantastic class reports. But the worry is whether that will be sustained as she goes through the school system, living in a family where her parents work hard but are struggling just to get by. Kirsty spent the first five years of her life sharing a bedroom with her parents in a private flat with no outside space. In that five years, there was not one offer of council housing. So they scrimped and they saved and they borrowed to buy a small two-bedroom flat. Kirsty's dad works shifts in a factory and her mum can only work part-time in a shop because they can't afford childcare. Kirsty's mum's got no choice but to work Sundays. And then to make that even worse, an employer has just taken away our Sunday allowance. It's a rare occurrence for Kirsty's mum and dad to have a day off together, so the right to family life isn't obvious for this hard-working family. And holidays are a luxury that quite simply they can't afford. Originally, this family got welcome tax credits, but then the department made a mistake. But guess what? It's the family that have to pay it back, and that's affecting their already strained resources. Another current worry is that when Kirsty goes back to school after summer, she'll be in primary four, so she's not going to get free school meals anymore. And she's lucky that her mum breastfed her for a couple of years, giving her the best nutritional start, and that she's had a good hot meal for the first three years but now it's going to be a sandwich. And maybe this week, Kirsty's going to get to university. She's certainly clever enough, and not having tuition fees in Scotland helps. But without grant funding, it's just as likely that she'll have to try and get a job instead. In fact, research reported in today's Herald tells us that teenagers from poorer families are less likely to apply for university due to concerns about debt. There are too many children living like Kirsty in this country, children whose parents work hard just to make ends meet and feed and clothe their family. And their immediate aspirations are to secure housing, to have a secure housing, an annual holiday, and the odd luxury, like a visit to the cinema or a meal out, as my colleague Alec Neil mentioned earlier on. For others, they don't even have a home. They're relying on food banks and charity shops to feed and clothe their family. President Officer Shelter Scotland says that they are appalled at the level of child poverty across Scotland and alarmed by the recent increase and that more must be done by all partners to urgently address the causes, consequences and responses to poverty. Going back to the example of Kirsty, I would now like to mention a few areas that I think would make a big difference. Providing all families with decent, secure and affordable housing with outside space for children to play is vital. Last year, there was nearly 6,000 Scottish children in homeless households in temporary accommodation, and that was an increase of 17% on the year before. To address this, a Labour government, if elected next week, would implement the most radical house-building programme since the war, and Scotland would gain the consequentials of that. Labour would also extend free school meals for all primary children, something that I have personally long campaigned for, and colleagues in the chamber who have been here as long as I have will know that. And of course, that used to be SNP policy. But actually, free school meals in primary one to three was only implemented due to the Tories and the, the Liberal coalition introducing it 
and passing on the Barnet consequentials. And of course, the Tories now, unfortunately, want to take that food out of the mouths of children. President Officer, childcare is another vital issue in tackling child poverty and allowing families to earn. The Scottish Government pledged to double free childcare in Scotland, very welcome, but private nurseries are saying that the scheme will fail if the rate offered to nurseries does not cover costs. Labour will give families what they need with flexible, all age year round, wrap around affordable childcare. So, President Officer, as the rich go richer and they wonder where their next yacht is coming from, the poor grow poorer and they wonder where their next meal is coming from. And that is a gap that's widening, with the wealthiest 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 50%, according to the government's own Wealth and Assets in Scotland report published in February. We have the powers in this parliament to tackle child poverty. This bill provides the tools to measure it. And so now we just need the political will to eradicate the appalling reality of child poverty in our rich country. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm allowing fi fairly wide-ranging speeches, uh, deviating a little bit from the fact that it's a stage one bill, but I understand why. Um, can I then call George Adam to follow by Jamie Green? Thank you, presiding officer. And as a member of the Social Security Committee, I, I welcome this stage one debate because this bill deba we're debating today is something that I'm very passionate about because I'm sure like most in the chamber, there is nothing I want more than to see the children of Scotland flourish and thrive. And I want to see our children achieve their dreams and I'm committed to knock down any barriers they may face as a result of their circumstances, family income or postcode. I want to be able to pass on a prosperous and fair country to my own children and grandchildren. And like Alec Neil, I'm a grandparent, but obviously a wee bit younger than Mr Neil as well. As well. Uh, I know that the future generations will not be negatively affected by the harsh and frankly unforgivable, unforgivable UK Tory cuts. In order to do that, we must ensure that every single child in Scotland is protected and given every opportunity to succeed. And we must break the often crippling cycles of poverty hard-working families all too frequently find themselves trapped in. I agree that when Alec Neil said earlier on that just measuring poverty isn't enough, but I believe this bill is a step in the right direction. I believe we need to see where the area is and get the data. Many of the individuals that came to the committee actually stated that, that we needed to get that data. But often in debates like this, areas like uh, Paisley and in particular Fergusley Park come to mind and they're always regarded as areas of deprivation. And Richard Leonard is of course correct when he says there has been generations generations of uh, issues with poverty in these areas because that's true because my family come from Fergusley Park. My father got a trade and was able to work his way out of it but many of his colleagues and many of his friends and schoolmates are still there and have lived that life. I know them because they come and tell me they can't my father and uh, they tell me of their problems and things that have happened in their life as well. So I think when you're talking about Elaine Smith's uh, real life stories, for me, this is very real that we get this right, because these are people that my father grew up with and now we're dealing with people that I've grown up with and it's actually where my family comes from as well. And I want to talk about getting away from areas like Fergusley Park being areas of deprivation and talk about how much they can actually give our communities, because it is a, vi a vibrant uh, place to live as well. But since the SNP government has come to power, we've already seen a whole host of policies and approaches which have contributed towards tackling child poverty. However, unfortunately, presiding officer, our hands remain tied behind our backs in the face of further UK austerity and cuts, which are pushing more people into poverty every single day. And that, presiding officer, is simply unacceptable. Like my colleagues who have spoken before me, I'm appalled that in today's modern society, one in four children are living in relative poverty and over one million people live in relative poverty after they've paid their housing costs. Action must be taken and the Child Poverty Bill is a crucial step forward, but not the only thing that will make the difference as well. The Scottish Government are committed to taking uh, great steps forward and tackling this issue and the passing this bill will mean that Scotland will be the only part of the UK with statutory targets on child poverty. Not only does this bill set out four headline targets, the goal of eradicating child poverty by 2030, which is extremely ambitious, it holds every government department, most importantly, responsible and places a duty on our ministers to publish child poverty delivery plans at regular intervals and to report on their progress annually. 
Tackling poverty is everyone's responsibility, and this bill recognises the importance of successful reporting mechanisms and clear cooperation across the country. The delivery plans will contain a baseline against which progress can be measured in calls and local authorities, partner health boards, community planning partners and wider organisations such as employers and housing providers to work in partnership on shared priorities in order to deliver real leadership and support towards the goal of eliminating child poverty once and for all. The four targets proposed in the consultation, such as the goal to dramatically half the number of children living in relative poverty, has received strong support from poverty experts across the UK, such as the Child Poverty Action Group and the Poverty Alliance, and are regarded as more challenging than those repealed by the UK Government as they take housing costs into account. The Child Poverty Measurement Framework already in place addresses the wide range of drivers of poverty alongside the impact poverty has on the lives of children and our families. The three Ps, pockets, uh, prospects and places, focuses on maximising household resource and improving children's health and wellbeing through the provision of well-designed, sustainable and ultimately accessible places. The Government's new approach will build on and develop this area-supported network with the emphasis continued to place on regular reporting. This reporting and information will provide us with valuable data where we need to address future government policies to and inform us in the discussion, uh, uh, with the discussion and the decision making in the future. This for me, presiding officer, is one of the fundamental parts of this bill. It provides us with the crucial data, what we do with it, what the Scottish Government does with it, that is the key to actually helping. And this is how I believe, as Tavish Scott already asked, this is how and when we get things done with regards to child poverty. But we're already dealing with it. The UK government welfare reforms that we have already have had a significant effect on people in my constituency. Fergusley Park, again, is one of the areas most affected by Tory austerity. Indeed, a child born in Bishopton will live 16.4 years longer than a child born in Fergusley. It's essential that children in Scotland do not continue to be victims of the UK Conservative Party and are not penalised because of their postcode, household or circumstances from the minute they open their eyes and enter this world. The Scottish Government continues to protect our most valuable citizens, uh, vulnerable citizens, and ensuring that low incomes from further mitigating some of the worst impacts of Tory cuts. And I think, as I said, presiding officer, I said earlier, the bill and its intentions mean a lot to me. I've explained my background, of which I'm extremely proud of, and how this can make a difference. This bill can be the one step on that journey that every child in Scotland gets the same start and opportunities in life, regardless of where they come from and regardless of where they're born. Thank you very much. And can I say to Mr Neil, I'm not offended by you having your back to the chair throughout that, as I realise you're merely attentive to Mr Adams' speech, but remind members that not to sit with their back to the, to the chair throughout the debate. Uh, I now call Jamie Green to be followed by Claire Adamson, please. Thank you, Mr. Um, uh, look, I'm going to start by saying I had pre-prepared a speech for today, but over the course of the afternoon, I've sat and scribbled and rewritten pretty much the whole thing, and, and it might make more sense in a moment when you, you hear what I have to say. Uh, like some of the other members, I'd like to start by sharing a story uh, just to set the scene about why this debate is so important. I'm going to set the scene. It's a tale of somebody growing up in a tenement flat in a fairly atypical council estate in Scotland. The family has an unemployed alcoholic father who more than often will drink the benefits payment the day that it arrives, and a mother who cobbles together as many part-time jobs as she can to ensure that food is on the table, sometimes cash in hand, dinner, that night might be a pot noodle, or it might be a handout from a local church. There are problems in the household with addiction. There are problems with domestic violence. There are problems with depression. Are these problems the byproduct of their living conditions, or is it the other way around? I'll be honest with you, I don't know, and I wish I knew the answer. Many families on this estate, or scheme as we call them, are unemployed, and apart from black market or cash in hand jobs, there are households where a whole generation has not and never has worked. People live in each other's houses and they live in each other's pockets. Whoever gets paid that day is home to the rest of the close. You could call it a community, but it is also grimy, chaotic, and sometimes dangerous. 
The child in the house is often the only one who can't afford school trips, whose uniform is never quite as new as anyone else's, and who turns up to school hungry. The same person who had to walk to school rather than get the bus because they had no money. The same child who never goes on holiday when their classmates do. The child whose teachers know they're having a difficult time at home, but they are helplessly sympathetic. But no matter how bad school is, it is still not home. Now, I'm sure we can all imagine such a scene in our heads. It is normality to some people. And if you don't know anything different or anything better, you accept what you have because that's how it's always been. Presiding officer, that story is a story of my own childhood. And I share it today with members because it's not a sob story. This isn't an X Factor edition. But I was taken by George Adams' speech today and sharing his own experiences of Paisley. Paisley's just a few miles up the road from where I grew up in Greenock. I want the chamber to hear that story because I want to approach this subject with the gravest of attitudes and a heartfelt intention that we must get this right as legislators. So the Gibbs Hill estate in Greenock might have changed a lot since the 80s, but it's still as sad that we're having this debate today. I shall. Polly McNeill. First of all, may I commend the member on his courage to bring his own personal story, which I found uh, quite emotional to listen to. Um, I don't want to detract from that at all, but today's Britain and the picture that's been painted about child poverty is one of which the child who can't afford the school trip is the child whose family are in work. And I just wondered if the member would also acknowledge that that is the picture that we need to kind of work out the answers to. Jamie Green. I do accept that. I, 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 and that's why I said, uh, by sharing that experience, that uh, my mother worked as much as she could. And we did have income. We weren't entirely reliant on state welfare benefits. So I do accept that there are families who are still struggling, even though parents are working. I do not detract from that whatsoever. Uh, the reason I mention it is because I think for me to stand up here today and be partisan in any way isn't the right thing to do, given the subject matter. And I have heard some contributions today, which actually I've been quite disappointed by, uh, knowing, knowing, knowing the members. You know, the whole the theme of Tory bad, SNP good, or this party good, this policy bad, I, I think doesn't do this subject any justice whatsoever. So if I can, let me talk briefly about the bill uh, in the little time I have. There are lots of words in it. There are lots of definitions and calculations, measurements, reports, and targets. And they're all very well and good. And indeed, they're the foundations of the bill. But only one section actually talks about the delivery plan. Now, it's not the job of legislation to define policy. That is a matter, a political decision indeed, for the government of the day. But it's interesting to note that the Social Security Committee acknowledges that the setting of targets alone will not reduce poverty. Now, I'm new to the legislative process, so I don't pretend to know the answer on how a bill addresses the root causes of poverty. But surely it must be about more than just income levels and how to measure them, surely. Now, I don't have a problem with the concept of the bill, but it also says that the Scottish Government doesn't control all the levers it needs to to improve the lives of everyone in Scotland. Well, in my view, education and health are devolved, and therefore I would like to see in later stages of the bill what has been done to, and I include things like closing the attainment gap, because good results at school do make a difference. I guarantee you, I wouldn't be standing here today if they didn't. We may not have had money when I was a child, but we had books. How will the bill address the real problem of long-term worklessness in a home? How will the bill ensure that funding for the third sector or local authority services that tackle alcoholism or drug abuse or domestic violence, that their funding will be uh, protected or will be in place? How will we ensure that grassroots activity to address poverty will be looked after? Now, will these just be in the delivery plan? And if they are, what recourse is available to us as a parliament if these are not adequately and they're not independently measured? It's not just health and education that fixes the problem, just like it is not income that only defines poverty. I had much more to say, but I think in the spirit of the debate today, I just want to be clear that I have no interest in opposing for opposing sake as we go through the stages of this bill, nor do I think that one party or another holds any magic wand that will eradicate it. There is goodwill and good ideas coming from every side. And I hope, I genuinely hope, and I do believe that this parliament, even with our disagreements, 
and our political uh, posturing can bring out the best of those ideas at stage two so that the end product is not just words on a paper, so that in 30 years' time, an SNP doesn't have to stand up in this chamber and share his story because there simply is no need to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Green. I call Claire Adamson, the last speaker in the open debate, move to closing speeches after that. You have been warned. Ms Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I am not a member of the committee, um, but I would like to thank the convener and the members who have put together the State One report for today, and also all of those who contributed to the consul consultation and the work of the committee and have contributed to their evidence sessions. I'm sure they weren't easy evidence sessions at any point. I'd also like to commend some of the organisations who have provided briefings for today's debate, and I want to pick out a few of those examples from today. Children First um, were emphasising that one in five children experience poverty, and that the Institute of Physical Studies has stated that there will be a 50% increase in child poverty by 2020. Absolutely startling statistics. And they also welcome the fact that local government, community planning partnerships, uh, and community-based um, third sector organisations play a vital role in tackling these areas and welcome the fact that local authorities and health boards will be included in the legislative framework. Children and Young, Commissioner, Young People's Commissioner of Scotland has also um, highlighted the, the, the UN uh, the rights of the children and um, the briefing that has looked at the UNCRC and um, highlighted the articles that are pertinent to the work of the committee at this, this stage. CPAG, who are very supportive of the, um, the, the aims of the bill, uh, highlight that the cost to the country of poverty uh, is £29 billion a year. And that's by quantifying policy interventions, long-term losses to the economy through lower education attainment, and the cost of poor mental and physical health. And I think it was Tavish Scott who talked about the work that Harry Burns had done on health inequalities, highlighting these areas. 20%, 25% of the children in North Lanarkshire, where I live and grew up, live in poverty. Inclusion Scotland have also highlighted the disproportionate effect of poverty on families affected by disability. And that includes children who are disabled, but also the families who have a disabled parent. And I look forward to um, maybe some insight from the Cabinet Secretary as to how she, she is going to tackle these particular issues for disabilities. Can I commend the work of the committee? I've already thanked them for it, but um, and say to, to Sandra White that she talked about the consensus view that they were able to reach. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that that was able to be done, but um, I'm a bit surprised that it is, given the nature of some of the debate this afternoon, because there is an absolute gulf, it seems, between the Tory benches and perhaps every other party about what are the symptoms and the causes of poverty. What we, I would see and my, many of my colleagues would see as the symptoms the Tories seem to think are the causes of poverty. It is more complex than that. And I hope that if anything, we can move forward in an agreement that it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to, to tackle. However, um, there was a lot of emphasis put on under attainment in education. And I, I, I just question how um, Mr Tomkins can exhort the actions of his colleagues in North Lanarkshire Council who have supported Labour um, and um, in absolutely slashing the number of classroom assistants in North Lanarkshire, possibly 190 posts to go, and I question how this can possibly help with educational attainment in that area. We've also heard this afternoon that workless families, 60% of the children are from families in working poverty. Sometimes, to the, and, and I can't understand how the Tories can then argue that the two-child tax credit limit will do anything other than exacerbate this problem, along with its horrible rape clause. The DWP themselves have estimated that 3,600 households in Scotland will be detrimentally impacted by the benefit cap. But Scotland has some opportunities. It's a modern, successful country with a wealth of talent and natural resources, and it is completely unacceptable 
that one in four of our children, our bairns, grow up in poverty. So I fully welcome the ambitions and the aims of the bill and wish the committee well in their stage two proceedings. I'm particularly um, thankful that the bill has included the child poverty measurement framework, which I think is a huge step forward in having uh, the ability to measure, to understand the drivers of poverty. Yes, we'll take Alec Rowley. Thank Claire Adams for taking, uh, Adamson for taking an intervention. I wonder, because she highlighted there one council where classroom assistants have been taken out, I wonder, does she agree that we actually need to look at a poverty impact assessment on every policy and budget decision that's been taken by the Scottish Government and every arm of that government, including local government and health boards? So a poverty impact assessment on every decision that's made financially. Claire Adams. That would certainly help to inform people's decision making. Um, but I, th I think, you know, in, in terms of when it comes to this area, Mr. Rowley, I've heard you argue many times about the council tax freeze and its effect on the ability of local government to provide services. And I mentioned that they are going to be included in this framework in the legislative programme, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, North Lancashire Council could have raised £3.8 million in additional funding had they chosen to use the council tax um, to, to protect services, which they have failed to do on this occasion. President Officer, I think I've run out of time. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to congratulate the Scottish Government on some of the areas that it's already um, working on to, to tackle poverty in our areas. So the £750 million containment programme that will help close the gap, the £20 million programme that includes £12.5 million from the European Social Fund to tackle poverty across Scotland, the fact that our primary one to primary three children are benefiting from health and nutritious free school meals and the introduction of the baby box and also the fact that we have kept the EMA, the Educational Maintenance Attain educational maintenance allowance which supports children from poor, children and um, students from poorer backgrounds to maintain their position in the education system. Thank you, presiding. Thank you very much. I move to closing speeches and you've made my weekend because you're all in the chamber for closing speeches. So I'm a happy bunny now. I call Alec Rowley, please, to close for Labour. Six minutes, please, Mr Rowley. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, and I'm happy if you're happy. Can I, can I say that, that, that this has been a, a very welcomed debate today and I think that that is one of the important points moving forward. We actually need to have this debate in here and I'll commend the work of the Social Security Committee and the report that, that, that you have produced. But we actually need to have this debate within the whole of our country because Poverty and inequality and the levels of poverty and inequality in Scotland are surely not acceptable to anyone within this chamber. And how we tackle inequality and poverty are big, big questions with big, big challenges that are wider than, than the debate we had here today. But it's a debate that the whole of the country, I believe, need to have. And I hope that moving forward from this to stage two, stage three, we will be able to widen that debate in communities right across Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary talked about uh, the UK government where they announced their intention to repeal significant parts of the Child Poverty Act in 2010. And Jamie Green made the point that, that can we take the politics out of, of here and SNP, good, Tory, bad, I think was, was how he put it. But we have to acknowledge that government can and sh should address poverty and inequality. Mm -hmm. And it is down to government as to how much we do that or we don't do that. So, as I mentioned to Liz Smith, the, the last Labour government cut child poverty in the UK by over a million. It wasn't by accident that that happened. It was because they introduced policy that targeted poverty and lifted children out of poverty. Over, over this last, last year here, I just find it shocking that we have 40,000 more children in poverty in Scotland today than we did at this time last year. And the projections, projections moving forward are fairly bleak. 
So it is down to government and it's therefore down to politicians how we address that. Richard Leonard in his speech talked about the need to redistribute not just wealth in this country but power in this country. So the offerings that come forward from political parties and I would urge you know, those who are interested in how we tackle the bigger questions to look at the Labour Party manifesto that they are fighting this current election on. Because in there is big ideas about how you redistribute power and wealth within the United Kingdom. And fundamentally, that needs to happen. But the UN, the Committee of the UN Conventions on the Rights for Children, noted when that decision was made that they had serious concern regarding the UK government's repeal of the child poverty targets. It recommended that the UK set up clear accountability mechanisms for the eradication of child poverty, including re-establishing concrete targets within a set time frame and measurable indicators. And that's why I think there is unity across this chamber today in terms of the bill that's come, been brought forward. Although a number of people have said, Alec Neil, Richard Leonard, Wally McNeil, have said we've got to move beyond simply targets. Because having targets is one thing, being able to address poverty is another. And therefore, action speaks louder than words. Action will speak louder than targets. 40,000 more children in poverty since last year in Scotland. 260,000 children in 2017 in Scotland living in poverty. The Institute of Fiscal Studies are forecasting a 50% increase in child poverty across the United Kingdom by 2020. So under the Tories, the average household income in Scotland fell by over £600 in the last year. 467,000 Scottish people earning less than the living wage. So we must move beyond targets, and that's why Labour are saying that there should be a £10 living wage introduced across the whole of the UK. If you're serious about tackling poverty, you need to take the measures to be able to do that. 70% of children living in poverty in Scotland are in a family where at least one person is in work. So it is the question, what are we going to do about that? As Ben McPherson made the point, we need to be able to, when we reach 2030, not simply say another target not met. Because Governments of all colours are good at bringing forward targets and then not meeting them. I believe we need from government and from all of us in this debate some coherent proposals moving forward. And part of that is a coherent anti-poverty strategy that despite all the other strategy documents that's there, they have not been pulled together. So I would repeat my request again to the Cabinet Secretary, let's look at what a coherent anti-poverty strategy for Scotland would look like. Bolling McNeil raised the fact that a number of organisations do plan and have put forward the idea of increasing the, the family allowance child benefit by £5 a week. Over the lifetime of this parliament, if we reach that, we would lift 30,000 children out of poverty. Now, there is a target. There is something as a direct result of a policy we can actually introduce. I do know that sometimes government ministers, when they're no longer ministers, talk about what they should have done when they were ministers. But Alec Neil, uh, from, from his own uh, speech today says that the cost uh, that he asked when a minister, the cost of addressing those on lower income in Scotland would be £2 billion. I do hope the Social Security Committee will ask Mr Neil to go back and give evidence on that proposal because I think it would be worth looking at. Let's look at what it is that we need to do. On the question, presiding officer, and I'll finish on this, of an ind independent commission, Oxfam have been absolutely clear. They say that it should be fully independent of Scottish Government, both in practice and in perception. I think the Minister 
the Cabinet Secretary needs to take that on board. There is unity within this chamber. We need an independent commission to ensure the scrutiny and make sure that these are not just targets, but they're actually going to be actions that will address poverty in Scotland. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I call Adam Tompkins. Eight minutes, please, Mr Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, this has been, I think, a really good quality debate um, from all sides of the chamber um, that has included within it two really quite sparkling uh, and um, memorable uh, contributions from Alec Neil and from my friend and colleague, uh, Jamie Green. Um, I thought that Alec Neil's uh, speech was brilliant, brilliantly wrong, but brilliant uh, nonetheless. And I want, to go, I want to go straight to the issues that um, Alec Neil and uh, Jamie Green uh, were talking about, which I think is, uh, you know, not just philosophically interesting, not just intellectually interesting, but, but very, very important in terms of getting our anti-poverty strategies right. What is the relationship between not having enough money uh, and between all of the other issues that we've been trying to talk about, including educational underattainment, including the attainment gap, uh, addiction, um, family breakdown and everything else. What is the relationship? Is it a, is, is, is it a, what, what is the cause of what? What is the effect of what? what is the, which is the byproduct, as uh, Jamie Green put it in his um, uh, remarks? And Jamie Green said that he didn't know what was the cause and what was the effect. And, um, and I suppose that um, puts uh, the finger on the issue that we are trying to grapple with uh, from these benches on this bill. It is not our view that you can think only in terms of addiction and family breakdown and, uh, um, and educational underattainment and the rest. But it seems to be the government's view that at least as far as this bill is concerned, you can think only about income. Uh, and what we're saying is that, you know, thinking about either end of the question on its own isn't going to work unless you join it up and think about it all together. Now, I think the, you know, the, the, the truth of this is encapsulated in the government's own measurement framework on child poverty, which exists right now, which includes you know, a, a, a significant array of 37 different indicators of child poverty, uh, poverty that don't just focus on income. They talk about living wage and employment. These uh, indicators talk about good health. They talk about mental health. They, they talk about eating enough fruit and veg. They talk about talking to your mum. Um, they talk about housing, they talk about crime, they talk about drug misuse, all in, uh, an, effective, an effective child poverty strategy, an effective anti-poverty anti strategy, whether it's about children, families, or anybody else, isn't going to work if it focuses only on income. That's our point. Our point is not, our point is not we should do away with the income targets. We're not, we're not in a second. Our point is not that we should do away with the income targets. Our point is not that we uh, should uh, pass this bill only having taken these income targets out of the bill, but that on their own, these income targets will never be successful in achieving and in delivering what the uh, government's own uh, um, aspirations are of eradicating child poverty in Scotland by 2030. Alec Neil. Thank the member for taking an intervention. Can I say, and I'll refer again to the Health Scotland report, what it showed was in tackling health inequalities, for example, a, a, a basic a decent income is a prerequisite to solving the problem, but it's not the total solution. Clearly, you need other policies in relation to childcare, housing, health, education, and all the rest of it. But if the people who are living in poverty don't get a decent basic income, the impact of all these other policies will be substantially diluted and we won't achieve our objective. Adam Tompkins. In that case, I think the disagreement between us is actually really quite, quite tiny. But my, but my point is this, that unless we add some of these broader concerns to this bill, this bill won't work. It won't achieve what it is setting out to achieve because we're not doing it at the moment, right? I mean, the government's own statistics show that the percentage of P7 pupils from the most deprived areas who are performing well in numeracy is going down, not up. It's gone down from 2014 to 2016 from 60% to 54%. And a similar fall we see in the percentage of P7 pupils from deprived areas performing well uh, in uh, writing, gone down from 61% to 56%. So we need to do more legally than we are currently doing to put obligations on the face of the Scottish statute book to require ministers to take steps to address these problems as well as the income issues that Alec Neil and others have rightly uh, talked about. It's not a question of either or, 
It's a question of both. And that is why, as I said, we will be seeking to amend this bill, not to take anything out of it, not to take anything out of it, uh, but to, no, not at the moment, not to take anything out of it, but to add to the bill legal requirements on ministers to take steps to close the attainment gap, to reduce the number of children in Scotland growing up in workless households, so that we can address not just the income of poverty, the lack of income uh, that poor families suffer from, but some of the underlying drivers and causes uh, of that too. And Tavish Scott, who isn't here, um, asked if we're going to add education targets, why not add a whole, ho why not add a whole a host of um, other uh, targets as well? well? We want to focus on education because there's clearly a relation, this is a child poverty bill, and there's clearly a relationship between uh, children and young people uh, and uh, education. Now, you know, you don't have to take uh, my word or the word of any Conservative member uh, uh, for uh, any of this. Let me just quote to you two pieces of evidence that the Social Security uh, Committee received. The first from Peter Allen of Dundee City Council, who talked about the, the contributory factors, those are his words, the contributory factors behind child poverty. Attainment issues, he said, will be one of those factors. Attainment, issue, attainment issues are a contributory factor that contribute to child poverty. Strong targets associated with attainment, target, with, with attainment issues would be more meaningful, he said, than waiting for five or ten years to see whether income measures have changed. And Bill Scott from Inclusion Scotland said this, disabled children are twice as likely as non-disabled children to leave school with no qualifications, regardless of the type of impairment that they have. There are disabled children with sensory impairments and physical impairments, but no intellectual impairment whatsoever who are leaving school with no qualifications. That makes their chances nil in the current job market. Unless we change that, he said, we will not change their future. And when they become parents, they will be parents living in poverty and their children will be living in poverty. So we have to change the cycle. And that is the force of the argument that we're trying to make from these benches, that focusing on income alone will fail to meet the laudable aspirations of this bill whose principles we support. And if we are serious about tackling poverty in Scotland, and in particular in the context of this bill, if we are serious about tackling child poverty in Scotland, we need to think about educational under attainment and addictions and family breakdown and worklessness, as well as focusing uh, on income targets. If I've got time, presenting officer, I'll happily give way to Sandra White. Briefly, please, Ms. White. Oh, thank you. So I thank the member for taking the intervention. You continue to talk about uh, attainment, and you mentioned about Bill Scott and disabilities. Do you not think taking DLA off of people and put, when they go on to PIP has got something to do with poverty rather than an attainment gap as well? Mr. Tompkins. And the fact of the matter is, of course, that under the current, in the, I was going to say in the current parliament, in the parliament that's just been dissolved uh, for the general uh, election, more is to be spent on disability benefits than on any previous parliament in uh, British history, more than 50 billion uh, pounds. Two uh, final points, very quickly, on interim targets. I would very gently say to the cabinet secretary that I don't think that putting the detail of interim targets in secondary legislation is quite going to meet the concerns of the Social Security Committee, but that's an argument that we can have uh, at stage two. I do nonetheless welcome that she is at least willing to move uh, on interim targets. And the final thing that I would like to say by way of substance is a point that a few speakers have talked about, um, but which I didn't have time to touch on in my opening remarks, is that, which is the um, importance of uh, amending section 10 of the bill so that the requirements on local authorities are not merely to look back on what they have done with regard to child poverty, but to look forward also uh, um, to what they propose to do over the coming period with regard to child poverty. Setting targets sends a message, Sandra White said in her speech, uh, and that's a, a, um, a line that we took from uh, evidence in the Social Security Committee. I agree with that. Setting targets does send a message. It's an important step, but I want to do so much more than that. I think it's important not just to measure child poverty, but to take concrete steps to tackle and reduce it. And the amendments that we will be seeking to make to this bill will be designed to help the government realise those aspirations and not get in the way of them. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mr Tompkins. I uh, call Angela Constance to close for the government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Uh, this has been uh, a good debate uh, across uh, all benches, and I actually uh, agree with Adam Tompkins on one thing, and that's of the outstanding uh, speeches today from Alec Neil and uh, Jamie Green. And while you know many of the aspects of today's debate is characterised by the technical underpinnings and the philosophy of statutory income targets and the processes around uh, interim targets, delivery plans and parliamentary process, which I'll seek to answer these questions as much as I can uh, within eight minutes. But the point I want to make is ultimately poverty and ultimately addressing poverty is about people and it's about children. 
And Jamie Green made me reflect on a, a favourite quote of mine from uh, J.K. Rowland. She's obviously a woman with a personal experience of poverty, and of course she knows a lot uh, about children as well. And she says, poverty entails fear and stress and sometimes depression. It means a thousand petty humiliations and hardships. And climbing out of poverty by your own efforts, that is indeed something on which to pride yourself. But poverty itself is romanticised by fools. And I think that encapsulates uh, what we probably all agree on, is that poverty crushes the spirits of individuals and families, and it can crush uh, communities. And the consequences of child poverty it can last uh, a lifetime. It stunts a young person's physical and mental well-being and can affect uh, their life chances. Now, Alec Neal says rightly that you can't afford uh, not to address uh, child poverty. And I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I think we're all mostly, with the exception of the Tory benches, agreed on the, the centrality of income or the lack of income. And that's not to say that that's the only aspect of poverty, when there's poverty of opportunity and poverty of aspiration. But Tavish Scott, in, in his own way, I think, made the link between having that focus on internationally renowned uh, legislative targets and how that then links with a measurement framework. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation described the government's measurement framework as a quantum leap forward. And it covers all those issues that are both a cause and a consequence of poverty, uh, disability, uh, attainment, fuel poverty, rural poverty, drugs. And again, that is not an exhaustive list. But those measurements, which we're currently reviewing, because actually I think those measurements can be better, but you won't necessarily want to put that framework or those measurements in statute, because a lot will happen between now and 2030, and our measurement framework needs to be flexible to respond to the issues of the time and the evidence. And I know we'll come back to uh, the issue uh, of interim targets and uh, I welcome that discourse uh, with uh, committee. And the interim targets will be statutory, they'll be anchored in the bill. My plea and, and my preference around regulations is I want these targets for us to set the interim targets together and for them to be based on the very best of evidence that is available to us. And in terms of the delivery plan, which is the overarching plan for the action. The delivery plan, it's not your measurement plan, the delivery plan is where, it's about what we're going to do, it's how we take it beyond measuring uh, poverty. And again, that needs to be responsive to what is happening today, what's happening next week, next year, and between now and 2030. And Tavish Scott and others, and I think the convener of the committee, made the point that no target is perfect. But the statutory targets that we have are internationally renowned. They have been developed over decades and have overwhelming support uh, from uh, stakeholders. That doesn't mean that they won't change at some point uh, in the future. But the important point, and I think all members would agree and have encapsulated this, is actually about uh, the action. And members have questioned whether targets and legislation in itself is not enough. And of course, they are right to raise that question. But the point I want to make is that requiring government, me, to measure, to report annually on progress invites a degree of scrutiny that ultimately leads to better action. We're not demurring from our responsibilities. And I often talk about how, as a government, we're fighting child poverty with one arm tied behind our back. But irrespective of the constitutional settlement or the future of Scotland's constitution, what I want to do here and now in terms of the day job is make sure that this arm <laughs> is as strong as possible. Certainly. Alec Rowley. Secretary for giving way. Does she therefore agree that where public bodies, because public bodies will be needed to actually meet, deliver on these targets, where they're setting budgets, should they have an impact assessment that describes what the impact will be in terms of poverty of their decisions? Yes. 
Yes, and I keep trying to tell you, Mr Rowley, that this is something that we already do and it's actually something that we could do better uh, once we implement the socio-economic duty, a dormant part of legislation uh, that was in legislation that your government introduced, uh, but the, the, the government over there uh, chose uh, not to introduce. And the equality budget statement, you know, already has measurements of inclusive growth because I think that gets uh, to uh, the heart of the matter. And I want, presiding officer, to stress about what it is we can actually do as opposed to you know, uh, pointing out some of the problems uh, with the issues that we can't address. Because Jamie Green's right, you know, health education has devolved. It's sad to say many of the economic levers and equality legislation and other matters are not devolved. But I want to focus on what we can do in this place. Because make no doubt about it, while child poverty north and south of the border is at scandalous levels, it's too high in Scotland as it's too high in England. But child poverty used to be in Scotland at similar levels to the UK going back to the 90s. And on every measurement today, child poverty in Scotland is lower than any of the UK home nations and as the UK as a whole. And I would contend that's the difference that this Parliament has made through many actions, uh, many actions too many uh, to mention. And of course, we can and we're going to have to do more, uh, much more. And of course, while there's no uh, silver bullet, um, and you know, I know, Alec, I know what Alec Neil said about the big ideas, but the touchstone issues of affordable housing and our record on affordable housing uh, is absolutely uh, second to none. In our two terms of office, uh, we delivered 65,000 plus affordable homes, actually thanks uh, to the good office and leadership uh, of Alec Neil. And we want to step up that to 50,000 uh, affordable homes uh, over the lifetime of this parliament. So I'm content, uh, presiding officer, that, that in terms of the, the big touchstone issues, we look at how those can be uh, anchored uh, in the bill. In terms of the issue about the statutory commission. I've listened very carefully to what committee uh, has been saying. I've been listening carefully uh, to what our stakeholders have been saying. And of course, the Oxfam report um, is an exemplar report. But, you know, I come to this first and foremost as a parliamentarian uh, before a minister. And what members are describing actually sounds to me more like a parliamentary commission and that is not in the business of government. The business of government is to deliver on our manifesto. We'll, of course, come back to this issue at committee. And our plans are for a poverty and inequality commission to anchor that wider uh, anti-poverty approach. It will indeed be full of experts and big brains and independent folk like Naomi Eisenstadt. Now, you can't say Naomi Eisenstadt uh, is not uh, independent. But I'm not currently persuaded of a statutory commission and I have to confess that as uh, in part due to the financial costs um, ar around that when every, every penny uh, is a prisoner. And similarly with topping up uh, child benefit, it's not a bad idea. I'm just not convinced it's the best idea. And if you are talking about £256 million per annum, I would want all of that £256 million to go to poor kids we are under the proposals that I've seen from some stakeholders and the Labour Party. Only three out of every uh, ten pounds uh, would go to a child that would be considered to be uh, in a poor household. Presiding officer, I know that I'm uh, running out of time. It's been a good debate uh, across the chamber and we will come back uh, to the many issues uh, that have been raised today. And I want to thank all members for their contribution. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes the Stage 1 debate on the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. We now move to decision time, and there is just one question today. The question is that Motion 5879, in the name of Angela Constance, on Stage 1 of the Child Poverty Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. That concludes decision time, and I close this meeting. <laughs>